Okay. Evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the August 2022 meeting of the City of Beacon Planning Board. We're going to begin our agenda tonight uh, by uh, reviewing the applications for certificate of appropriateness. Uh, we have four on the agenda. And so we'll start with uh, the two signage applications for 172 Main. Looks like there's one for Queen's Music Academy and the Spirit of the Universe. Is that applicant here with us? Uh, yes, if you're here for the Spirit of the Universe or Queen's Music Academy, please come up to the mic. Yep, come on up. Um, I will also make note that we've had a resignation of one of our board members, J.C. Calderon. Uh, he won't be uh, hearing any of the applications tonight. However, he does have an application at the end of the agenda. Just wanted to make the board and the public aware of that. Thank you. How are you? Very well. Thank you. This is our first time. We've only been in Beacon a month. And so uh, we haven't had the opportunity to discover this um, meeting agenda style. So my name is Melissa Moore. This is my husband, Steve Roberts, in the purple. And uh, we are opening a shop at 172 Main Street called The Spirit of the Universe. Great. Uh, and I'll take a second to welcome you to Beacon. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your submission. Um, so the application is for a sign. Yes. Uh, in front of us we have your graphic that represents the sign, the artwork. My first question is, unless I'm missing it. That's weird. Can you hear that okay or that's so much? It's, it's Fading out, in and out, okay. yes. Go yeah, ahead. I'll, I'll try to project, thanks. Okay. Usually we give Kevin hell for that, but I see. tonight it's me. Uh, so, uh, no, I see it here. It's just a 30-inch round sign, uh, metal. Yes. And I'm assuming by the graphic that you intend for the background to be white? Yes. And it will be two-sided because we're right at the end of the uh, walkway going toward the community garden. It was the old uh, guitar shop. That's where we are. Great. Do you have questions, Len? Um, is there an existing bracket for the sign? No. The Ron, I guess, was the owner of the guitar shop, took it down. We're trying to contact him to see if we can buy it from him. Otherwise, it will be exactly the same kind of wrought iron uh, with two brackets on it. I, I just want to point out and, and this is something that maybe we can communicate when people submit stuff to us as a board. I know you've said in the past, John, that we would like to see the bracket details also, or the, you know, the construction, the dimensions, the materials, in addition to the sign. And often we don't get that. Sometimes it's, if it's existing, it's not an issue. But in this case, um, that is kind of a missing piece. OK. Well, it's, it, we are after. Um, the former owner of the business to see if we can just purchase the sign, the bracket from him, which was wrought iron. It was black, and very typical to most of the other ones that are along the street. Would your intention be then, if you did procure this from him, to paint it white to match the sign? Not necessarily. No. Could could we make the recommendation that you do so? Of course. We, we looked into getting a bracket from um, I don't remember the the sign play fast signs it's called up in Fishkill and they they don't have anything on their website that shows signage uh, the the holders so we have to go there look on their computer and and discover what they've got but we can certainly have it in white no problem yeah <clears throat> to lens point typically we would look for the sign complete with bracket okay as part of our review 
Um, I'll leave that there for a sec. Any other questions, yeah. Karen? Also, um, where on the facade are you considering putting? Because we also have a sign, you know, on the same building that we need to coordinate. Right. Uh, um, the entrance to the music place, which is upstairs from us, is its own entrance, number one. Um, and there's plenty of um, wood facing around the door for it to be separated from ours. So it wouldn't, neither would have to hang terribly low. Yes, there so you are. Are you on the edge of your building? Are you in the center of the storefront? On the are you on far the edge, on the brick the itself. Brick. Mm -hmm. There's a brick surround, and then the rest of it is wood. We would use the same place that the guitar person had on the brick itself, okay. which is the whole storefront before the music doorway. Great. I think the location makes sense. Yeah, um, the one other, I know that the building inspector has size requirements, but this is slightly larger than most of the signs in that neighborhood of yeah. storefronts. So yes, this young lady here had uh, told me that when I came to the office with the measurement. So we would, I think it's a uh, two and a half by two and a half. If it, if it were square, so we would make it fit into that format. But it, ours will be round; it won't have a square facade yeah. on it. Yeah, okay. you have it listed here as thirty, so that yeah. that's in line. Just forgive me. There's two applications. One is for the music sign. That's not you. That's that not us. To be a coincidence. That it's the same address. Yes, exactly. Theirs is upstairs <coughs> with its own stairwell entry, and ours is at street level. I'm fine. Nothing. I'll accept a motion to approve. Motion. Motion by Karen. Second. Second by Kevin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so then back to. I think when we, you know, just to, if I can interject one thing, we may want to set up a, a procedure in the future where we have a way of checking if we're missing pieces that we don't. Yeah, let's take on the agenda. But I agree. Okay. Let's take that offline and we can talk through that with Dave and others about how the applicants, applications are vetted. Thanks. Um, so next item on the agenda is the uh, Queens Music Academy. Is that applicant here? Hi. And you brought your actual sign. Yes. Uh, my That's name the is Daniela Rosinski, and I'm here representing my neighbor. My name is Graciela Rosinski. I'm here representing my neighbor, uh, Choi Fairbanks for the Music Academy School on okay. the second floor. So this is the sign that I have. So yeah, if you could just hold it up so we can have a look. That's the actual sign you're intending to hang. Yes, it is. Again, a first. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I have a bracket. Maybe, right maybe we make that the requirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to make comments on at that point, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we don't like it, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll ask the same questions, more likely, about uh, how you intend to hang this. Uh, on a, a bracket on the edge of the wall. Yeah. My only observation question is that I'm curious if there's any opportunity to make this top bar a little slimmer. It's it's can the top yeah can the top bar on the bracket be a little bit more slender so it doesn't look so chunky? Yeah, it's pretty prominent. That's very easy to remove those so and change it. Do you, mm -hmm. do you know the dimensions of the bracket? I have it right here. I don't know the dimensions. <laughs> okay, the only characteristic we can use to ask and carry with the motion to approve would be that you agree to 
make it shallower. Yeah. Um, any other questions? No. And you tend to paint it black. Can I see the sign again? Please. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, motion to approve with the condition that the applicant reduce the height of the bracket. Motion. To a dimension less than what's shown in the drawing. Motion by Lynn. Second. Second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. You're welcome. So what I should do with the, the application, you guys gonna sign it? I mean. I'm just doing a favor to my neighbor, and I don't, I don't know what's next. Uh, honestly, we usually don't know what, what happens next. Once it leaves here, it just happens. Um, the building inspector? Yeah. Then she'll get the permit from the building inspector. I have it right here. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item under architectural review, certificate of appropriateness, appropriateness, 9 Rombat Avenue. Is that applicant with us? <laughs> you may. <laughs> wow. What are we looking at here? Uh, so, so basically, there's a... Uh, You may commence your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell he's new at this. <laughs> so, um, it, it, it's an existing house with the existing screened in porch in the front. And the idea is to basically enclose the screened in porch. It's getting expanded out a couple of feet towards the front of the house, but essentially still held back from the main part of the facade. Um, the materials, you know, the siding will match the existing, windows will match the existing, and, and then the, the whole house would be um, painted those uh, new colors. You, you can see that there's some existing photographs and it's, uh, the, the paint is rather deteriorated, so the, the entire house would be painted, but that's where the work is gonna be. So wh what's the body of the house, this one? Yeah. <laughs> and then this appears to be the trim? Trim and windows, yeah. And then, this? And then th that, that's just where the entrance trim is. The, that it, it appears darker on the on the rendering there. Uh, you got a lovely from Karen. <laughs> hmm? That's okay. It's not black. It's not black <laughs> or dark, dark gray. That was the first choice. <laughs> Thank you for advancing our yeah. realm of choices. Any other thoughts, questions, or comments? I'll accept the motion to approve. Motion. Motion by Karen. Seconded. Second by, what was that, Len? Len? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thanks. Do, Thank do you, you need to hold those or should I grab those back? I'm going to use them for my house. Okay. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, our last application under architectural review Certificate of Appropriateness, 477 Main Street. Recognize this place? No kidding. You have a lot hey, of. Teresa. Uh, my name is Teresa Kraft, and I'm representing the Helen Cultural Center. Great. Come visit. Um, I s submitted the packet and the fee, and there was a letter that I'd like to read so the public can also hear it. But the letter. I wouldn't expect anything less from you, Teresa. Okay. A letter. But the letter was written by Ronnie Beth Sauer. Awesome. And everybody talks about the Renaissance of Beacon. Ronnie Beth and her husband, Ron, were the Renaissance people. 
This is Ronnie Betts' design. Dear members of the Architectural Review Board and Planning Board, I am a member of the Board of Directors of the Helen Cultural Center and actively involved in the current renovations. Major work has begun inside. We are currently fundraising for money to begin the exterior. We would like to obtain a certificate of appropriateness to paint the front main entrance door the color black. Please see all the attachments sent. This color will greatly enhance the image of the facade and is in keeping with the brick details. This color adds stature and dignity to the building and provides a fresh image to the facade as we go forward in our renovations. Please note how the, this brings out the elegance of the brass hardware. The present door and its red color is not original, and the door is not original. It's a reproduction. It lacks contrast and diminishes the majesty of the front entrance. Please assist us in returning this important edifice to the stature it deserves. Thank you. Great. Great. Nice hardware. Nice. That's gorgeous. And that's right. actually the black. It's not black, black. It's got some gray in it. Yep. Yeah, this is, this is one instance where black looks just fine to me. Right? What color is it now? It's the red, right. isn't it? It's red. It's and if you look in the packet, you'll see that you don't really even see the door. It just disappears in the portico. Yeah. Is there, I'm just curious, for no other reason than I'm curious, does this comport with an original paint scheme in any way? Is um, there scheme? are no actual photographs yeah. of that show. Uh, we have a watercolor, but the building doesn't even look like the building in the watercolor. So some could say it was red. Some could say it was a darker color. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, it, it did go before the board, and it was voted that we could move forward on this. The board of, of the, the Helen Cultural Helen. Center. Well, if they say okay. Right? <clears throat> Any other and if you come inside, we painted the gallery uh, a red, very similar to the portico. So it'll be this majestic black into the red instead of red, red. You're not painting the wood inside, though, I hope. No wood is ever painted. Good. <laughs> Except in my house. <laughs> Start stripping. Any thoughts, questions, comments? I think it looks beautiful. I just want to point out that it's consistent. All the windows, the sashes are black right. in the rest of the facade right. and with red trim. And so this is consistent with the rest of the facade. And it also, it looks, it does pop out the hardware. And it's a period it's color it's as a well. period color. Yeah. And as we heard recently, uh, there was an excellent history uh, um, uh, talk that we, um, some of us shared um, about the polychromy that was used in mm -hmm. this and some other local buildings that hopefully we'll have an opportunity to uh, uh, view and uh, share with other board members. It's, it was very interesting to me. Great. We have our word of the day, polychromy. Okay. Um, I'll accept a motion to Thanks. approve. Motion. Motion by Karen. Second. Second by Kevin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Aye. Okay. So we will move to our regular agenda. <clears throat> um, first item of which is our continued public hearing on an application for special use permit and site plan approval for a hotel and event space at 1113 Walcott Avenue. Mr. Chair, can I just note one thing for the public, there's four board members here tonight, so any action taken by the board is going to require a unanimous approval. Any members of the public, uh, you know, want to adjourn because there's only four board members here. Typically, that's uh, an appropriate action if the board's acceptable to that. So. I said if, if any of the applicants who are looking for a vote tonight want to adjourn, they are permitted to do so because only four board members are here tonight. Okay. And they require a unanimous vote. So. Just so you've been duly alerted to the fact that we are a quorum. Absolutely. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, members. Uh, for the record, my name is Taylor Palmer. I'm a partner with the law firm of Cuddy and Fader on behalf of the applicant. Although it wasn't a public hearing, I would have said I also agree with the color uh, for the Howland Center, so polychromy. Um, uh, on behalf of the applicant, we are here tonight in con uh, connection with our continued review uh, for uh, site plan and special permit. Uh, for 1113 Walcott Avenue. Uh, tonight I am joined by Aria Siegel, our architect, uh, Richard D'Andrea, our parking consultant, and Mike Bodendorf of Hudson Land Design. Uh, the applicant is also joining us this evening. Um, 
At this point, we are uh, still involved in the continued secret review of the project, and we open the public hearing, uh, which is now continued to this evening. Uh, we did make a supplemental submission to your board, uh, which included responses to comments uh, from the board and from uh, the public at the last meeting. We were last before you in June. Uh, we did take a month off in July, not for vacation, but to look at uh, the different uh, options that we had to move forward. Hearing the comments from the zoning board, from the public, uh, and your board, we wanted to make sure that the application reflected those, uh, and the applicant took a hard look and, and, and put in our supplemental submission. The result of that uh, consideration is a reduced development proposal that now has a maximum number of 198 total uh, uh, guests or attendees for, and I'm removing the word occasional, for intermittent uh, events that will be held within the existing church building. Um, the purpose of saying intermittent is because they aren't always going to be a Monday, they aren't always going to be a Thursday, they aren't always going to be a Sunday. So we wanted to make sure that the occasional reference was reflected in the intermittent because it could be a Tuesday through a Wednesday, it could be a Wednesday through a Sunday. So we want to make that clarification. Um, we note this represents a sick, uh, the second significant reduction uh, in the overall project design over the course of the last year. Uh, that this has been before the board. The applicant originally contemplated uh, a proposal of 420 persons max for event space um, before previously reducing that to 350 attendees. So now we're at a 50% reduction over the original proposal or a reduction of 222 uh, total uh, attendees at maximum uh, events at the, uh, at the space. REA in a minute, um, I believe you have your computer, will show um, the changes to the internal uh, layout of the church as far as the event space that uh, is concerned for the reduced development proposal. This expands the stage area uh, and provides physical barriers between the riser and the stage areas, including gates and railings and curtains. Those are other ways to help, again, curtail or, or reduce um, the areas occupiable for uh, those events. <clears throat> With respect to the hotel and cafe, the proposal remains the same. Um, it's still a 30-room hotel uh, to be available 24-7, 365, uh, and the cafe will accommodate 50 people really serving the hotel guests um, and only operating uh, for hotel guests or if there are events in, in the space, it would not operate separate. It would be operating for the event. Uh, before I turn it over to my, uh, the mic over to Ari and then to uh, the applicant for a moment, um, we are anticipating a building inspector determination. I see that Dave's not here. We did have a chance to speak with um, the, the planning board attorney and understand that that's forthcoming. We'll be speaking with Dave uh, and uh, the planning board attorney next week with respect to the parking uh, requirement. Our supplemental submission, as we understand it, is now zoning compliant, uh, utilizing the 1964 exception, uh, and that is the reduced development proposal. So in our, we'll address that with the building inspector, but the proposal as reduced no longer requires uh, a variance from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, one other piece of information we did just want to update the board <clears throat> uh, on as we are in the secret process. Uh, the State Historic Preservation Office did issue a no impact letter. So they uh, identified that uh, the project is appropriate and will not have an impact on historic or cultural resources. And that's the development or adaptive reuse of the church, the uh, proposal for the uh, hotel, and of course the uh, improvements to the cemetery. Uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will turn it to REA just to briefly walk through those uh, internal changes, um, and then we'll have Gavin and, and Rich speak to, for the benefit of the public, some of the updates, including some other off-site uh, parking areas that were uh, in the process of, of working through so that we have other. I just want to parse something you said real quick, where you mentioned uh, seeking a determination, which we know is forthcoming, and your statement that parking is zoning compliant. Those two are very different things at the moment. Yes. Yes. We're seeking confirmation that what yeah. we understand to be the zoning compliant parking regulation is consistent. So that's forthcoming. Meaning, I don't want anybody to conflate your statement that this parking is zoning compliant with the determination, because that's still pending. <laughs> we understand at this time, but we will await the final determination, which it won't be confirmed until the building inspector makes that determination. Thank you. Good evening. So um, the, the building inspector also, in, in order to be able to review the proposed uh, event configurations and to have a, a way to sort of enforce the occupancy that we're claiming, wanted to see a couple of different um, floor plan configurations. One, one where there's a staged event with riser seating, and then one where it would be more like a wedding where the riser seating would be gated off um, so, so basically, I'm, I'm showing the, the two configurations. The one, the one up there now is the riser seating with the stage. Um, there, there's a 
uh, uh, you know, like a, a railing and gates that would be between the seating and the stage so you wouldn't get overflow. It, you know, it, it's, that stage area is reserved. There would be no audience members there ever. Um, and then th there's 198 seats total, so that, that's the capacity there. Um, in, in the other configuration, that riser seating would be gated off. No one would be allowed up there. And there'd be some configuration of either tables and a, and a dance floor, or it could be standing room. If, if, if you look at the occupancy in terms of standing room, you, it, you also get slightly less than 198 people based on square footage. But um, you know, so, so we, we, there's a curtain track, there's the railing, there's gates. Uh, um, you know, so we, we wanted to comply with the inspector's requirement that, that there'd be some kind of physical um, barrier between the, the, the two types of events. Forgive me if I missed this when you were talking, but is the intent that the Exdorf area be taken out of commission to achieve that occupancy? That, that, yeah, basically that's just to show that in in the wedding type event or you know where where people would be occupying the 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 floor area, they would not be allowed to also occupy the riser seating. So that that xed out means that that would be um, gated off. It's basically just you know showing the two different types of, of events that could happen, but yeah. but 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 there are physical barriers that um, that are in place and would be used. Okay. Thanks. Is that is that typically how occupancy is controlled, or is it controlled administratively by you know ticket sales and event planning, and then? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the and reasons also, why I asked. I mean, this is somewhat self-policing, right? And also by formally, I mean... It's just another mechanism. I mean, part of the comments that have come out throughout the process are using the building inspector to enforce the code and the approvals and the, re the restrictions. We're adding other self-policing mechanisms the same way we're adding off-street parking or trying to work with off-street parking areas to add additional availability, even though our traffic report shows that we don't have that, that there's we can meet our demands. We're just adding other self-policing mechanisms, um, and this is one of those ways to do so. To answer your question, it's somewhat unique. Okay, and would we formally would the city have the ability to formally change the occupancy rating for the building from what it is now currently, which is much greater than 198, such that it would be, you know, a violation of code to. It'll be a site plan condition, so it would be enforceable as a site plan condition, but I'll, I think John looks like he's got an answer. It would also be through the state building code. So the building inspector would look at occupancy loading based upon the state building code and the fire code. And the determination would be made from there, depending upon what they do within the building, um, that will dictate occupancy levels. Yeah, and I don't want to get into nits and nats, but the building code would guide you on maximum allowable. Not which would be higher than what we're right. It right. would always be higher than what right. you're talking about. Not right. minimum, right. as required by stipulations of right. this uh, application. So, so you could only use the resolution on the, or the site plan approval to enforce in yes. the future. Not it wouldn't be some. It wouldn't. It wouldn't also be a municipal, you know, rating on the buildings. So, you know, like no. fire marshal says only 198 people. It's not going to be that. No. Yeah, I mean, D Dave Buckley would also have some leeway to set a, a maximum occupancy. So, you know, based on the certificate of occupancy, and then he would he could post that in there. So, that, you know, I think I think there's like a double mechanism there. So, so okay, so that would and that what you're suggesting would be kind of answering my question in the affirmative. There could be a, a CFO issued saying maximum 198. Maximum allowable. You can't hear either of us. Can you? Yeah, no, you can. okay. So we have to really. I mean, can we get a little yeah, bit more down on these things? AV, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. All right. So what we were the guy behind the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> what we there. were what we were saying is that um, there. It's. I had asked the question: Is there a mechanism for the city to designate a new allowable occupancy for the building in the in the future, dependent on how everything's resolved? We're not there yet, and REA was saying that the building inspector could issue a new certificate of occupancy such that that would be laid out 
not only in the resolution approving the site plan, but also in the certificate of occupancy for the building saying max occupancy 198 or whatever should be decided. So there's a couple of mechanisms by which that can be established and enforced. That was my question, and I think I've, I've had it answered satisfactorily. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good distinction, and it may go so far as to carry with it the requirement that that occupancy max be stated public, you know, in a public visible place within the building. Yeah, like on a sign. <coughs> so. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Can I just Please. make one comment about that? Is that occupancy is also limited by uh, the life safety factors like the egress, the uh, door units, and all these other things, some of which may conflict with whatever we are saying they're allowed to do or limited to do, right? And which uh, we, I want a clarification on who's. Um, or, okay, no, no, no. Which authority has uh, jurisdiction and whether or not it overrules any uh, restrictions that we may want to play up, uh, place on the uh, use of the site? I'm, I'm going to go with the assumption that they will design to whatever their target occupancy is so that if they are shooting for 198, it'll be on the onus of their, of their architects to have the appropriate ingress and egress and the building inspector will confirm that, but it's a good point. Right. I mean, one of the things that I brought up before was if, in fact, uh, they need additional um, uh, doors, or the doors need to be located in different places, because so, uh, Kevin, we're not talking about increasing the allowable occupancy by code based on egress capacities. So all of that lives and exists underneath and is still in place. A stated maximum occupancy based on this application, which is de minimis to the overall maximum occupancy. So we're not putting any safety concerns out by limiting and reducing far from the stated code allowable maximum occupancy. Does that make sense? Right. I mean, where I was going with this is uh, if uh, the exterior envelope needed to be modified for life safety reasons, then that was something that we would not be able to accommodate if we'd already passed an architectural review. I don't understand. They, they need to comply with code. Period. Yeah, I, it, mm -hmm. it'll sort itself out. Anyway. Thank you. Um, my name is Gavin Hacker, and I am a, a partner with Prophecy Hall. And I just want to briefly summarize to the public what's happening right now with um, our plans and our current proposal. Um, uh, bear with me. I have a page and a half to read here. So it won't take long. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak about our plans to adaptively reuse the Reformed Church of Beacon and the adjacent Parsonage House. Hopefully, I can clear up any misconceptions as well as speak to specific concerns here. While I have spoken with a lot of our neighbors, I have not had the opportunity to reach out and respond personally to everyone, and I apologize for that shortcoming. I have read letters and heard from our neighbors at the View, West End Lofts, River Ridge, Hammond Plaza, and the residents on the surrounding streets. Our proposal, which has, ironed out, which has been ironed out over a year now with the planning board, calls for the transformation of these two buildings into a cultural center for art, education, and performance. Our hotel will provide the unique opportunity for artists and organizers to be accommodated right next door to the exhibition space where they will stage, rehearse, and bring creative, innovative work to an intimate audience. I come from a background in nonprofit theater where it has always been a struggle to fund and accommodate artists. Grants and donations are often not reliable and come with limitations while also consuming an endless number of administrative hours. Here we have the ability to use our hotel in a way that provides funding for artists and programming as a grant would. Essentially, we're creating an environment and campus that is optimal for creative output while at the same time reducing production costs for artists and organizers. The idea is that we will also be able to provide quality and affordable programming to the public. The church was purchased with the blessing of the former congregation who also weighed in on and supports our plan for adaptive reuse. Our decision to pursue this project was further solidified um, by support from city officials and the mayor who at the time were also contemplating the future of this property. They had voiced their opinion that the church and parsonage would w be well served as a commercial establishment which would help link the MTA station to Main Street 
and be woven into the fabric of downtown Beacon. The project is adjacent to neighborhoods typical of high-density urban living as defined by 30 or more dwelling units per hectare with close proximity to transportation, businesses, and other services. Currently, the church is underutilized and has been that way throughout recent history. Its continued survival relies upon a consistent, well-funded, and maintenance and repair. The city of Beacon cherishes its history and our population deserves the ability to experience some of its finer historic buildings. Just last week, as the Howland Library hosted its milestone 150th anniversary, anniversary, we were honored to play a small role in the celebration by being part of a tour organized by the American Institute of Architects. One of our objectives is to work with and nurture relationships with local institutions, businesses, and artists. What we have proposed not only preserves two buildings and restores a cemetery, but also brings new life and engagement to a building that was once a center for community. This church was built to be an important and busy institution that serves the community, and we strive to continue that tradition. The existing church was built to accommodate well over 300 guests with a current capacity of 336 patrons and has existed for over 150 years, predating the surrounding developments. In response to the comments and concerns of our neighbors, we have prepared a reduced development proposal that addresses the neighborhood's concerns and constitutes a greater than 50% overall reduction in capacity from our original submission in July of 2021. We will be reducing seating capacity for events to 198, as well as reducing hours of operation. Many of our neighbors have told me that they find under 200 people to be an acceptable capacity and will support this. Our cafe will serve a maximum of 50 people for breakfast and lunch and or be open during non-event times. Its primary function is to serve hotel guests and the surrounding walkable neighborhood. <coughs> During regular business hours, the church facility would be available to patrons for workshops, rehearsals, retreats, seminars, classes, and talks, lectures, or kids programming. Events of 198 capacity will typically be limited to weekends and end between 10 to 11. For a bit of perspective on size, compared with other venues in Beacon, our occupancy number is significantly less than the Roundhouse and Town Crier which can serve 250 to 300 guests. And our maximum audience number is a bit high, larger than the Howland Cultural Center at 125. All windows will be treated for sound containment and amplified sound from events will be indoors and adhere to all local ordinances. The nature of events will be of high quality, low impact, and maintain an intimate experience and atmosphere. We will ensure the safety of our patrons and neighbors by designating security to oversee and ensure a smooth and non-disruptive operation outdoors and indoors. Since full capacity use is limited, it is common for event spaces to rely on off-site parking, especially those of historic significance, built before cars were invented. Recent successful examples of urban renowned cities nationwide place significant value and emphasis on a smart approach to planning in order to maintain safe, walkable, pedestrian-friendly cities. <laughs> it is essential to utilize available parking and not create more urban sprawl with deserts of underutilized pavement for parking lots. It's an important goal to work towards a reduction in car traffic by promoting and supporting walking, biking, or public transport. Beacon has worked hard to provide a safe network of crosswalks and paths that already connect our site with available parking and public transportation. Our plan also includes a secure rack to park 25 bikes. The impact from traffic and parking with our proposal is negligible as determined by our own study and further confirmed by the City of Beacon's own traffic consultants. We will have 31 parking spaces on site while the rest of the parking, 50 spaces, is off site within a two to five minute walk. A detailed parking plan and map is contained in the submission and we are proposing temporary no event parking signs to be placed on nearby streets and developments if deemed necessary and appropriate. We will provide staff and security outdoors and indoors to mitigate any issues, especially during times when patrons are entering or leaving an event. There will also be a deck curfew in place to prevent anyone from being on the deck in the rear of the church past 10 o'clock on weekdays and 10.30 on weekends. And um, that is the end of my summary. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, I can answer any quick questions or any questions if you have while I'm up here to respond. I have none at the moment, board. I wanted to hear comments from our consultants before I had any questions. Yep. I was going to just touch on the traffic and the parkings for uh, our modified uh, proposal here. So 
Um, okay. So <coughs> I'm just going to start with a quick traffic comparison of what we had before and what we, we now have at the 198 uh, uh, attendees. So obviously for typical conditions, we're not really changing anything. When you look at the event conditions from 350 attendees to 198 attendees, we're approximately a 40% reduction in, in our traffic generation for, uh, for the, the facility. We didn't um, do a new traffic analysis for that 40% reduction. The, basically, our conclusion is that the results of the original analysis kind of remain, uh, and our conclusions there remain the same. And that will still work with DOT to, to mitigate any, any items that they feel necessary. Um, and so that, that's on the traffic end of things. For parking, if you could just go to the next slide, Aria. Um, similar comparison for you. So <coughs> again, typical conditions when the hotel and the, event, uh, the cafe space are the only things operating, no change. Um, we're still looking at 48 spaces uh, to accommodate those with the 31 on site and 17 that will have to be off site somewhere. Again, the primary use for that cafe is really to support the hotel, but it, the idea is that it would be open to the public as well. Um, during events, uh, looking at the event uh, generation now at, at 198 attendees, that now requires 58 spaces for the event. Uh, that's now reduced from 81, what which previously per code. Uh, again, we still propose the cafe and event space will be non-simultaneous uses. Um, and if we go back to our assumption of 50% of hotel guests also attending events, uh, that reduces the actual parking demand for a reset to, for, to 42 spaces. Sorry to interrupt, I just want to highlight what mm -hmm. you just said. You've stated that the cafe and event space will be non-simultaneous uses, meaning when the cafe is open, the event space isn't operating. Correct. And vice versa. Right. Okay. And we've been maintaining that throughout. Can I, can I ask a clarifying question about that? Because I think there's been a couple of public comments that probably express some surprise at that. And I'm just wondering if there's a... If, you know, if there's something further to say about that that would probably answer some of that. So I would imagine if there's an event going on, the cafe kitchen may be open, but there's not going to be any more people than the 198 Correct. event participants allowed into the building. Right, and that's so what that, we... So I think the important distinction is that, because I think some people from the public, based on some of the letters I've read, are like, it doesn't make sense that the, you know how this non-simultaneous use is being described. But, what, but I think the key thing is that if there's an event going on, the cafe will not be open to non-event goers. So you can't have 198 people at an event plus another 30 strolling into the cafe for you know a, a late evening snack. It will be only for the, the group already served by the event. That, is that, it's is that true? different from what I heard you say about non-simultaneous. The well, the, that w the description, the description that, that Len gave is correct. That, so the idea is that the cafe will be so we'll be there to support events. So if there's a wedding going on, the kitchen space can be used for a wedding. If there's, if there's some other performance going on, there may be concessions okay. sold or something Two like things. that. The cafe use, I may have this wrong, should carry a certain occupancy as well as the event space should carry a certain occupancy. So you're blending the two at 198. But I'm also curious whether, meaning, you're blending the two, 198 total. They're using both the cafe and the event space at the same time. Does the 198 also take into account support staff and others who will be in occupancy and potentially driving there? Again, those those are not how par the parking is calculated. For example, that's not how the parking is calculated. But we certainly understand that distinction. But to to be clear, the cafe will not operate separate and apart from the event space when an event is taking place. The cafe will only support the event when there's an event in that building, period. So the, ho the hotel is operating. The, the, the cafe is really designed to serve hotel guests and, and, and residents really in the immediate area of the property, but it's really designed as a support for the hotel. But if there is an event taking place in the event space, the cafe will only be serving and servicing that particular use. But the parking, parking regulations, for example, generally don't take into account those separate 
uh, the, the employer, the employees, or otherwise, as far as calculating the parking requirement. So I know there are two different issues that we're, we're considering here. Is that right, John? Yes. There's so many, <laughs> there's so many variables here we're talking about uh, that it's hard to, yeah. hard to put them in, into place because, okay, what if, if it's not a 198 occupancy event? Mm -hmm. What if it's a 55 right. person event in the middle of the day? It's a conference that's associated with the hotel. Are you saying that the cafe will shut down for every event, no matter what size? larger events now right. what how do you define larger right you know and all these things are variable and I don't see how you can operate a cafe in which you're closing periodically mm -hmm. uh, based on some sort of arbitrary other use uh, so that people come to the cafe wanting to sure. have lunch and they find they can't because the but I think either closed down even if that were the case if you limited the the if you, if you need a specific number, the way that it's been described, that can be easily addressed by taking 198 minusing the 50 that the, the cafe could serve, and you've addressed that issue ultimately from an attendee's perspective. I'm just talking about an operational use. It seems very confusing right. Right. to be able to have a conference, a cafe that's open sometimes and open, not open sometimes mm -hmm. by no particular schedule that changes from week to week based on we events. Can, we can work to address that. The, the yeah, comment that's come up, but I think the numbers game is, is a different issue than what you're describing as a logistical consideration. Yeah, just as far as detail or mm -hmm. just that sort of thing operationally defining just exactly what sure. the application expects so that we can understand it. And then obviously that does to some mm -hmm. degree tie back to parking. Yes. So the other question I had was this concept of large events occasionally. I, I personally would like a little bit more definition of what that occasionally means. Understood, and that's why we moved away from the word occasionally to intermittent because, again, occasionally, <laughs> occasionally is no. they both have the definite. Yeah, I actually had to write the definition down so that to be to be very clear. It's time for um, another journey through the Oxford English. You said it was going to be polychromy, but my word of tonight was going to be intermittent, um, which is occurring at irregular intervals and not continuous or steady. The concept being, you don't know when whichever conference is going to have a day when they need a Tuesday, Wednesday. You don't know. You know, so the, the operation is a seven day. There's a potential to have. Can we drill down into <laughs> frequency? Is there a limit that yeah. we're going to put on per month? How many big events? I mean, so I again, the big events, big events was 350. So that was a different, different characterization but as far as you're calculation. 198, how many events per month that you're going to have 198 people at? Yeah, I, th I think, you again, to just, to, just to help us them. understand and the public understand the impact of a potential big event event now divined as 198 total how often is that going to happen right so intermittent or occasionally it's still vague the answer I have for this is that it would average out over the year to, to be approximately one per week okay so we want that defined okay I'm a little bit troubled by that only because it feels like you're trying to establish a, a use and have it thrive and prosper, but at the same time, it's kind of being throttled a little bit, which you know might, in some ways, be perceived as a as a good thing if if the neighbors perceive that there are going to be adverse impacts. But from another perspective, not so much a good thing for the longevity and profitability of the of the use, perhaps. Right. So it's a that's kind of a two-edged sword, and I don't I just struggle to understand how best to approach that it, sure, it certainly is tied directly to viability the size of the prior proposals that had larger event capacity meant that you could have fewer you could have a larger event less often to help offset those costs of maintaining the space and operating the site so those are unfortunately directly correlated but it, it is still a significant reduction as rich mentioned there's a 40 percent traffic reduction there's a parking reduction there's all sorts of associated terms and again we're committed to 198 and less whether that means a cafe is somehow operable or not those numbers will get to you the, the idea is it's 198 or less yeah, so as far as as far as the viability of your business model mm -hmm. that's not for us to of course opine on right however we want to see any application that we've studied and thoughtfully worked through with any applicant thrive 
So that's the whole point, right? So just something to consider. Right, so, so within an ideal world, we would want to resolve parking impacts, get the acoustics sorted out so that there's no noise violations, and then allow the events to happen at the, at the pace which they can find artists to come in. You know, I, that's what I'm saying is like, I hate to arbit arbitrarily say, well, there's this cloud of these impacts hanging over it, so let's just do one a week and we'll all swear to that. I'd rather resolve the impacts as best we can and say, hey, if you want to do Friday, Saturday, Sunday every week, do it or whatever, you know, I mean, that's, you know, control the impacts and then mm -hmm. go thrive, right? I, that, I don't know. It, it's a difficult question, and I know that the, the local, you know, venues that exist today in Beacon have similar operations and function. You know, it's it's it, there is if they could define out their schedule, they'd be, <laughs> I'm sure, very pleased to know the con you know the consistency and continuity going forward. We hear the, the comments my, though. My, we'll, my new we'll word to of the day is going to be context. You reference <laughs> other businesses in Beacon sure. that that exist in a very different context than the one we're looking mm -hmm. at here. So we have to take this context. And that's why we have reduced Deeply it significantly. But we, we hear the comments and we'll have to address the, the, the two comments. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. I'd also just like to say I appreciate that you're, you know, evolving the project over time. But, you know, to start with, it's really about what the site can handle and not just the size of the building. The building is large and, you know, it can't support the capacity any longer because the site has been restricted. So to keep going on about how you've reduced the capacity by half already, I mean, we're just starting to get into what I see as reasonable, you know, and it's still, I don't see how the site and the parking is supporting 200 people events, simply given the context that it's in. Again, right, and that's why we, we appreciate that comment, but that's, as Gavin mentioned, it's not a seven-day-a-week operation as far as that's concerned, as far as the maximum events. It's a hotel it that's running the, seven days a week. Right, but yeah, it, it's, not the, the it's, not the, it's not the frequency. Mm -hmm. If it's once a year and you have a, a capacity issue, it's still a capacity issue. Well, yep. Understood, and, 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 and if I just, as the chair mentioned for context, at an individual's home, they could host a wedding or a party without any controls whatsoever for, you know, I don't know what Beacon's event limit is. I think you're mixing apples and oranges, my friend. Yeah. Mr. Chair, respectfully, we are making a, a concerted effort for a historic property. I don't, I don't want to go down that, that I don't, I'm not here to speak to that. We're doing what we can to make sure the Understood. traffic reports show, the parking reports show that we meet those criteria. So we're, we're hearing the public's comments and your comments. That's all very fair. And I think, and I don't want to mansplain, but. <laughs> I'll just emphasize Karen's observation that we still have a parking issue whereby the parcel itself mm -hmm. can't accommodate the parking that's required to solve. Great segue. I'll put Rich back on, but I will mention also that we have been in discussions directly across the street with the church with respect to additional off-street parking in their lot. Uh, we also have discussions with another uh, uh, business on Dennings that would require uh, shuttling between the locations, but we have letters of intent related to those parking areas. So, so. again, uh, solutions presented still under review, study, assessment, so that's just kind of a placeholder for where we are right now. Right. Yep. Understood. No, we, we now are in formal, we're, we're entering formal agreements with other off-site locations to provide additional, in addition to public parking that's already available, but I'll let Rich touch more specifically on the parking. Yeah. Right, but I just have to say those types of agreements have proved to, you know, we have evidence in Beacon that, you know, a leased parking agreement is not a long-term solution necessarily. Right, and, and our study has shown that we don't need those, but we're, we're putting on top of the, the availability those other um, options, and it won't end with those. For example, the funeral home has indicated they would discuss with us once we're approved or once there's a project, not something that's still... In, in flux where they can have more formal discussions and that's another difficulty but you're absolutely right but these are not necessary based on our study we're doing it because we want to make sure that we're adding other layers uh, of availability so still under assessment thanks right so what Taylor was just mentioning mentioning was more or less what I was going to get into next so he mentioned the off-site parking locations and you know, we've discussed several locations, the Tompkins lot, the municipal lot, 
parking on Beekman Street, um, other further proximity locations. Um, Taylor mentioned we're, we're working on an agreement with the Episcopal Church. That is for parking on the, um, the basketball court that's across the street there. It's um, approximately 600 feet from the facility, so reasonable walking distance. And we estimated that it could park, it could park about 15 vehicles. Um, Taylor also mentioned parking on Dennings Avenue. This is obviously a little further away, three quarters of a mile away, but the proposal for that would be to provide shuttle service between that lot and, and the site. And that location could provide another 25 parking spaces. So all told, you're looking at 40 spaces right there with what's required for the 198 person event. You only now need 10 spaces in offsite, other offsite locations. And as we've talked about before, our study, prior to even considering any lease agreements or anything like that, we've shown that there's parking on Beacon Street. We've shown that there's parking on, in the municipal lot. We've shown that there's parking in the Tompkins lot. And I understand that there's proposals for the Tompkins lot to mo be modified, subject to the firehouse uh, expansion. There may be something in the municipal lot in the future that may reduce some parking there. But I think at the level of parking that we're at now at 198 spaces, we can more, com more confidently say that there's definitely going to be available parking in the area um, to when we need it. Um, I, I, let me, I'll just fi finish and then any other questions we, we can uh, touch on. Um, the only other things I wanted to, to mention were you know, in our traffic and parking management plan, which we, we submitted a revised version of, we don't have um, any real changes to the, the circulation pattern and how we plan to, to maintain traffic on the site. Uh, we still propose to have three parking attendants um, to manage the traffic flow. Um, there's some more details in there now about how emergency vehicles would be handled during the events if there wasn't an emergency uh, during the pickup and drop off time. Uh, also, uh, there's some discussion in there about um, how people who adi need additional time to get in and out of the vehicles would be handled. We do have four spaces that are ADA sp designated spaces. We are also identifying another location where they, they could pull off if that, that well, those weren't available and provide additional time for them while other vehicles could still pass. Um, and then lastly, uh, just on the off-site signage, uh, Gavin had mentioned this earlier, but hearing uh, concerns from the board and from the public, uh, we have added to our off-site signage uh, signs that say no event parking at Stratford Avenue, Rombot Avenue, Academy Street, and Beacon, Beacon Street beyond uh, the, the lots that we're proposing to use there. To, uh, that, and that's in addition to what we had already proposed at the entrances to West End Lofts and to River Ridge. So that's uh, my the end of my summary. So any questions? <coughs> Rich, explain to me how 74 Dennings Avenue is going to work. I mean, how are people going to know to get there? And two, are they going to be shuttled from there? How is the event going to know that people are there waiting to be shuttled? Yeah, the, the, the idea is definitely to have them shuttled from there. Um, I think what we've talked about thus far, and, and this needs to be fleshed out a little bit further, is that um, people that would be parking there would be either told to park there ahead of time or given the option to park there ahead of time and they would confirm that location. That way we know how many people are parking there and how many people, we have a certain number of spaces that we can accommodate there, how many people that we then have to accommodate per, on a shuttle and how that would work. Again, I think that, that the details of that still need to be fleshed out a little bit because that came to us kind of towards the end prior to our submission, but that's the initial thinking right now. Pardon my ignorance, but where's, no, it's down it's near the transfer, the transfer station. station. What, yeah. what the parking? business is current? It, there's a like a, there was a oh, the business, yeah, which is currently shut down. There's, it's not up. There's ah. no one occupying the building at the moment. Okay. I just don't see that working. I don't yeah. see people parking three quarters of a mile of away. Yeah, it was one of my same observations. I mean, you are showing some pretty distant parking options. So this idea of shuttling. Again, it kind of goes to the viability of the application, right? Um, you know, it, it's, if, if that's the solution, shuttling, more detail about 
You no, exactly how absolutely. that is intended to operate. Absolutely. And uh, times, sequence, staff, communications, all of this. I mean, and so, some of it's in in flux. So, like the Dennings thing, I think we can we can identify how that would operate and how that would work. Uh, if if the the funeral home becomes a, a possibility f for parking, then we can identify how that would get incorporated into any shuttling. Um, some of the the other locations that we were, we're talking about more closely here, we think are all walkable. Tompkins, so Municipal again, Parking, Beacon so Street. Be part of your outline, right? Yeah, and the, a lot of all of this is identified in the traffic and parking management plan, except for the shuttling at this point, which needs some more detail. Agreed. Yeah. Good. I'm glad you think so too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> can you uh, can you describe how the no event parking signs? How are those are going to be placed, or how are those set up? Are those like? Um, so the, the intention is that they would just be temporary signs that would be placed at the entrance to River Ridge, the em entrance to um, right. to West End Lofts, and at like the like on 9D at the entrance to. So or like the corner on the grassy verge adjacent to the sidewalk. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I don't know that the city has ever contemplated this or would contemplate this, but I wanted to ask the question about if this is a significant enough issue, would we ever consider just moving to signage on those streets that says resident parking only and you have a, a sticker system? So other places, other cities get to that point. I know, I know you've there, brought that up before. Um, my understanding of that process is it actually takes a an act of the state legislature. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Thanks to uh, to implement that, so it's a little bit of a different process. Yeah, it sounds like it's out of outside of our jurisdiction. I yeah. Realize that. Thank you for. So, I, I I do think it's a reasonable idea in certain situations, but I I believe that's the case in in New York that it takes an act of the state legislature. Okay. Anything else? Um, unless you have questions, I'm okay. Uh, we'll go uh, to our um, consultants uh, for any highlights on their reviews and comments back to the applicant. Uh, then we'll go around the board and then we'll make our way to the public. So we'll start with you, John. Um, just before we get off the topic of operational issues, um, it might help to clarify uh, what you consider a major event, what range, from 198 to what low number which would trigger the cafe being closed. So there's, there's more idea of how many major events in that upper range uh, would, would be, um, and how many of those would happen during a year. Mm -hmm. so, so you have an idea of sort of the, the big events and when there not, might not be an overlap between or non-simultaneous <coughs> use of the cafe right. and the, and the uh, event space. Mm -hmm. So where you might have double the parking needs at a lower occupancy level. Yeah. Um, so in my review letter, I go over a lot about parking, um, repeat some certain things. Uh, there's still questions that the building inspector has before he makes a determination on the 1964 provision in the code. Um, the, the new offsite arrangements that you've come up with, um, uh, we've mentioned the one that's very far away, and then the second one is on a uh, um, parking lot owned by the church on Beacon Street. Um, that is, that was in for an approval years ago. I don't know how many years ago, but within the last three years, I would assume, for multifamily housing, and they were using that basketball court for parking for the approved use. So they can't double use the pro pro mm -hmm. property uh, for multifamily and for event space because they wouldn't be non-simultaneous use. So uh, that would have to be clarified to see uh, if indeed the church is moving forward with that uh, approval for 21, uh, it's 21 South Street, I think it was. Yep, uh, the old Martin Luther King. Yeah, yeah. that corner building on Beacon and, and South. Um, there is a question that, you know, if you're going to limit the, cafe, uh, the event capacity to 198, why does the seating configuration on sheet six shows 288 seats? Uh, and does that new maximum occupancy include working staff members? Or is that just um, event goers, paid event goers? Just to get an idea of how the, the overall number will be. Um, 
I wanted to compliment you, the driveways are much better than they were in the last version in terms of the radius. I'm, we're trying to make the frontage of the historic church Center. not be overwhelmed by the new uses. Uh, and to that effect, um, I'm asking if you can reduce the amount of traffic safety signs. Those things are always, in my view, overused. The why you need two don't, do not enter signs on both sides of the driveway. Right. Uh, wouldn't one just be enough on a, a narrow one-way driveway? Um, things like that, instead of having multiple standing signs in the front sure. yard of the church. Not so much a concern about them in, in the front yard of the hotel, mm -hmm. right. but in front of the church. Uh, limit them as best you can and maybe consider moving the commercial sign to the mm -hmm. south side, to the hotel side, of, to the north side, the hotel side of the driveway rather than the, now that it's a one-way driveway. Um, there's a spot at, on the north between the two, the, the big parking lot in the back and the three spaces along the church that people can squeeze into right on the corner where people make that corner. So I would like that landscaped so that people can't use it for informal parking. I, I'm worried about parking sort of being squeezed into corners and then making a, yep. uh, turning radius and stuff. Um, other than that, I think you know, my points are smaller and easily fixed, I'm hoping. Thanks, John. Mr. Russo. The engineer is still developing the storm order. Um, we still need to witness that. Soil testing needs to be conducted. Uh, I've asked that they speak with the water and sewer department with regards to abandonment of existing water and sewer services uh, that go to this site. Um, and we've asked for some minor cleanup on some of the details with on the plans. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, many of the traffic and parking comments have already been hit on by the board um, and by the applicant. Uh, the main thing we're looking for is to expand on the shuttling plan just to verify its viability. Um, Other than that, it's it's you know continues to be the the parking requirement uh, versus parking demand, which is to be determined by the building inspector. Uh, it's our understanding. Um, I know John regarding the signing um, at the driveway. There is a there's a publication that kind of that sets the standards for signing. Um, what they have, uh, we find that it meets that publication, though they could reduce the do not enter signs to just one, uh, just place it on the right side of the road. Um, otherwise, you could enter into discussions with the DOT since they have the final call on those driveways and how they're designed. Uh, that's all we have. Great. Thanks, Doug. Any questions or comments to the applicants around the board? My concern is still with the parking mm -hmm. and the capacity and to ensure that that lease deals, um, if you're relying on those, are secure. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think that we need to make sure that the, the fun it functions um, you know, into the future. So, lease agreements are not so secure, in mm -hmm. my view. Thanks, Karen. One question: um, When will the when will there be a memo, like a technical memo, or even a short punch list of measures from an acoustical engineer or an architect saying, "Here's the measures that would be put in place to control the sound from the events, such that there'll be no, you know, we'll do these." These things will be done. This is how the windows will be treated. This is how other things will be treated so that there will not be an impact, a noise impact, because that seems to be a huge concern. Sure. And I think it's, you know, it's a bit of an open-ended question. I think everybody understands things can be done, but mm -hmm. enough detail to be able, for people to be able to assess, okay, this sounds like it would meet my, address my concerns. 
So I, I'll, I'll leave it to the architect. We can probably put that into a supplemental submission so that it would be incorporated into the plans. Most likely would be in the construction drawings more than anything else about their ratings um, for, for noise ratings. I, I see the architect chairman looking at me. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, that's important. Yep. And so thank you for pointing that out. Um, it is a secret issue. Yes, of course, as you're well aware. Yes. Um, so, more information, more detail on yep. that, not only in the submission. Then it's a code requirement. As, as too. part of perhaps right. the next time you come back, a description, right? That yes. We can all, all, not just the board here, but everyone in the room, hear Agreed. from you about. Okay. Yeah, great. Anything else? <clears throat> yeah, I think in that instance, and also <coughs> about the parking, what we want is more. Um, uh, less uh, vague assurances and more quantifiable um, uh, uh, goals uh, and uh, compliance with as, as, as far as possible. The, the, the complexity of the operational uh, proposals, the operational things that are going to be required that, that you're, you're proposing uh, are concerning because it's difficult to assure that they're going to be maintained. It makes it difficult to operate the the facility and uh, 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 the business, and uh, I'm just a little bit concerned about. Uh, uh, I, w I would feel more confident if it was simpler and if arrangements were made uh, that were um, more permanent. Understood. And just for the benefit of the public, to be very clear, there is a parking and traffic management plan. It's a fully detailed plan that evolves with the project and and the operations on the site. It accounts for all of this. It has identified that there is sufficient off street. Excuse me on-street public parking available to utilize the, the proposal at the site. So I want to be clear that the traffic study as reviewed by the city's consultant has addressed that there is parking in the vicinity of the property for the proposed use. We are looking at additional mechanisms to help satisfy the, not on, the, the parking that's not provided specifically on-site. So we understand the concern um, by the board about making hard and controlled <coughs> agreements with these neighbors but again the, the application also has the project also has to be realized to sometimes enter into those agreements they'll often enter into letters of intent and otherwise at this stage but we certainly under, understand the concern but we want to be clear that that's something on top of the available parking uh, in the area we know that the board has a has a, has a very specific in, in response to the public comments concern about that and we'll continue to work towards that thank you okay so we'll go to the public um, just b before we do um, I'm not sure how many of you are here for this application, so yeah, quick show of hands. We didn't do a sign-up sheet, so hopefully you can all sort of comfortably self-regulate, and Teresa's regulating herself first. But what I will say at the outset, so we, we typically, as is our practice, limit comments to three minutes. So, um, Mr. Kevin? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Hang on, I'm not done. Um, but I had asked that Teresa, since she had raised her hand, that she go first, so thank you. Appreciate it. But um, limit your comments to three minutes and to topics germane to the application. And please remain respectful to the public and to our board members. Thank you. Teresa Kraft Beacon. I'd like to wear two hats. First, I'd like to say as the Helen Cultural Center, I am the president. We had a presentation the other day, and we had an opportunity to tour these historic sites. And it was called Behind the Door Tour, because we knew in a few months some of these projects will never look the same. So on that, I want to switch hats, because we never, um, it was never political or anything. It was just an opportunity that fell in our lap with the AIA Westchester Hudson Valley and they came in and it just how it worked it was magic and we got to see some really amazing places so on that note I'd like to switch a hat and as a resident of this city I get that the world will never stop changing protecting history historic buildings is one thing maxing out a venue site in a poor location is another saga as a resident I find the overall concept renderings for this project grossless grossly misleading the lawn is not as large as it appears in these drawings. The driveway is in a dangerous location, and I have yet to see a single chartered bus, party van, or stretch limo drawn on any of these plans. 
One bus in that undersized lot will cause helter-skelter, let alone the multiple supply of delivery trucks that will be repeatedly going to this site. While I am glad the newly proposed plan has a maximum number of attendees at 198, what is the actual total when you include performers, venue staff, and cafe workers? To quote the applicant's legal representat representative, what is the real numbers game? I can still hear the city planner state at a previous meeting that it's a good venue idea to use an underutilized church structure, but it's at, a, at the wrong location. I strongly believe that that is still the case. Even with the newly proposed lower head count, it's a good entertainment concept, but still on the wrong size parcel and location. I would like to see the City of Beacon remove that 1964 or 74 exemption clause from its city code books. It's a wild card frequently used to the advantage of developers and mostly new to town. And please do not give away our city's public parking spaces. Do not approve the special use permit or site plan approval as it will severely impact all residents of Beacon, including you. Thank you, Teresa. Two minutes and 30 seconds, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Gebbin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Planning Board. From Name, an economic viewpoint. Name and address, please. Clark right. Edmund to Wilson, thank you. From an economic viewpoint, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, highest and best use, the city's tax, uh, uh, non residential tax uh, benefits that are realized from commercial property and the investment in personal property, in, in commercial property. In sum and substance, I would rather see a hundred room Aloft hotel with underground parking garage placed in this site than the proposal. There, it, it's a question of scale in terms of the investment, the opportunity for community to collect taxes that are meaningful and the employment. In this particular location, to the back left or southwest corner, lies the best view of the Hudson Valley closest to Main Street. Take a look. Evaluate it for yourself. So the front door, the train station, and the, the idea of receiving, the idea of passing on the church community into a new viable opportunity is not a bad thing. But it can be achieved in the properly structured real estate transaction where everyone wins and all the goals are, are, are met. The issue is, a question of confidence in the investment community that the city of Beacon is ready for that next step of, 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 of meaningful properties that can well serve the international airport adjacent to us. And there's a good uh, reason to have economic analysis by way of professional real estate analysis to guide the city as to the proper scale of investment that generates jobs and opportunity. This is not the proposal. They would be far better. The city would be far better. The planning board would be far better off designating these church properties that are linkage to the train station in a way that promotes and informs the community, that informs the international airline community, and whomever else is interested in investment and hotels that these two properties, the two church properties, represent an idea. It represents the inculcation of the community and arts with the practical reality of the necessity of creating jobs, creating commercial development in the city so that the taxpayers who are residents are not overcome by this development opportunities. It is a tremendous opportunity for the city. I only encourage the developer in the city to look beyond the current plan and solve the problems through identifying the proper capital investment. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Exactly three minutes. Yes. I'm Kyle Donnelly. I'm at 31 Beacon Street. I happen to be right across the street from the old Martin Luther King Center and the parking lot that's right there. I am very supportive of the idea of a performing arts venue. I, I've spent my life working in performing arts and I love the idea of that coming more of that activity coming to Beacon. Um, my question for you, and you'd you not be able to answer it now, is when 
all those people who ignore the no event parking signs because there is no enforcement possible on those signs when they line up all around our neighborhood what are we going to do as citizens of the neighborhood what will you suggest that we do because it will happen we know it's going to happen i'm right across from the street street from it so i accept this is going to happen i support the actual endeavor of it but I know what's gonna happen because those streets are so narrow that if people park on both sides, it's a one-way street. And if they're going down that street to go to the former basketball parking lot, it's gonna make it even worse. So again, you say there's enough parking, but on a micro scale, those of us who live right there are gonna have to deal with that. And I s just ask you again, not to for you to answer it now, but what are we gonna do? Because no event parking, nobody pays attention to signs like that, let's be real. So anyway, that's thank you. Yeah, we, we had uh, gone out and got a, a petition with about 250 people, the neighboring people that live in the community around this event there and, uh, you know, that weren't for it, that uh, do not want the people parking on their street. You know, they'll, they'll have a signs that say, you know, no event parking. Probably something like this would have written on a, in a magic marker. You know, I mean, uh, or can't they propose something that if they were going to say no event parking and block the streets off like they were going to have a parade on Main Street? You know, things like that to make it uh, better for the uh, residents there. I mean, you guys here that are having this and... You know, I think it's a great idea, but you don't live there. You know, you don't want to walk out your front door on your street and have everybody parked there, and there's not even enough room for a damn fire truck to get through. It's it's, it's crazy, you know. And uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was, uh, you know, for the events, you know, we went from 320 down to 198 or whatever it is. The uh, you know, what if you have too many people there? What if, what if 300 show up? Now what are you going to do? You're going to try to accommodate them. And because there's nobody there counting, there's no city people that are employed to be there and protect us. The cops are got their job to do. You're hiring people that uh, are going to direct parking out on the street or tell you where to go. The, uh, and when you go overboard on it, you know, you're going to get fined. You know, did we come down from 320 to 198 saying, well, it's cheaper to pay the fine. What's the fine, $25? You know, uh, how many times can we pay this fine before the city says, you can't have it anymore, you know? So uh, that's what I have to say. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm not for it. I'm not for it. I think our, our properties are going to be, are going to suffer for it. And I think when I look out my window at 10 o'clock at night and seeing everybody walking around in my front yard and pissing in the bushes, <laughs> we've all been to concerts, okay? You know, and if they're not serving alcohol there, we're going to serve it in our car. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you reminded me, we do have quite a number of written submissions letters um, on the subject as part of the public uh, hearing component to this application. All of those have been entered into the record, for the record. Hi. Hi. Uh, Jane Riley for Stratford Avenue. So right down the road from where this uh, project is proposed. Uh, I understand what they want to do and I can be supportive of the arts. However, the law is too small. Mm -hmm. The project is too ambitious. It doesn't fit there. If you want to have a hotel and a restaurant, put it on Main Street. You want to have a performing arts, not in that neighborhood. It doesn't fit. I don't support it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Shelley Simmons Bloom. I'm the board president of The View on um, Beekman Street, and I'm here to represent the concerned residents of River Ridge, Hammond Plaza, and The View. And as you know, each complex sits in close proximity to the church, the graveyard, and the parsonage. For us, there remain some key objective reasons that the reduction in the event capacity is insufficient, in addition to numerous, reason, numerous issues that remain un- or inadequately addressed. 
We've submitted in writing to you in detail our concerns regarding the traffic and parking considerations, lack of clarity around the hours of operation, security, noise and light pollution, so I'm not going to repeat those. However, I do wish to emphasise our concern with the developers describing our neighbouring community as high-density urban living environment, as we all know this is not true. The neighbourhood in question is quiet and entirely residential in nature. As the developers even write themselves in their cover letter, the community was built around a church, commonly referred to as a sanctuary, which is a place of quiet and refuge. This proposal would entirely upend the character of our neighbourhood and the nature of the sanctuary itself. Before it makes a decision, we respectfully ask the planning board to press for answers on the following specific questions which have yet to be addressed. So we've heard little bits and pieces about hours of operation, but we'd really like to drill down on the detail of the hours of operation for the hotel, check-in, check-out, cafe, bar, and the, the events. Um, as the developers are proposing uh, alcohol service for their events, how will they ensure that trespassing, vandalism, and harassment in our communities don't happen as a result of those drunken guests? What are the concrete measures the developers will take to ensure that the surrounding properties are not disrupted by noise? What penalties will the developers be required to pay if they're in breach of any agreements they propose putting in place to mitigate noise and security concerns? We'd also like to know if the property has been surveyed for lead, asbestos, mercury and radon and what remediations are planned and how the developers would ensure there's no possible health risk to any adjacent property. We'd like to know how the developers will prevent loitering in the cemetery, park and pathway um, before and after hours. And what type of programming does the developer intend to host for larger events? Even this evening, we heard Gavin talking about supporting the arts community, yet his other colleagues were talking about weddings on more than one occasion. So there seems to be um, some need for real clarity and drilling down there. Um, we'd like to know how the developers ensure that if they have their property approved, um, even with the best intentions, they wouldn't then sell it to less respectful owners. These, prop these developers have bought and sold venues in the past, so it stands to reason that the planning board should consider what successive ownership should look like if this is approved. And then finally, the developers claim they've consulted the local community, and I want to be very clear here, because I represent the view as well as, as our other complexes, but they haven't engaged in any discussion with the residents or the board of the view. Um, and we'd like to know why their latest proposal doesn't address any of the concerns that we raised um, at the last meeting back in June. So we'd like to see a full mitigation plan to prevent trespassers and address the noise and light pollution that will affect the communities before a decision is reached. Um, and to be very clear, we would love to see the church and the surroundings come to life in a way that enhances our community, but we don't believe this proposal, as it currently stands, achieves that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Can I ask a rhetorical question of the board for a second? If the Goodwill Church were to suddenly get an extraordinarily enigmatic minister and 300 people started showing up every Sunday morning and singing at the top of their lungs in unison hymns at 8 a.m., would there be any recourse for that? As long as they're not violating the noise ordinance. Anyone else? Hi, right, Matt Bloom. Uh, I live at The View, 30 Beekman Street. Um, uh, some of my points will be repeating uh, what Shelley's just said. Um, however, I think they bear repeating. Um, Shelley and I live at The View, um, Beekman Street, and um, in order of priority, our concerns and questions regarding the Prophecy Theater proposal are as follows. Um, they did claim, Prophecy Clear claimed um, to have listened to the concerns of the local community. I'd like to note for the record that no one from their organization has approached the unit owners or the board at The View um, who have formally expressed their concerns in writing and verbally in person at the last meeting um, with petition signatures. Um, the latest proposal includes no reference to the concerns of The View. In fact, the plan maps do not depict The View at all, nor do they show how close the proposed developments 
are to our 41 unit residential building the path starting at Beacon Street will run within several feet of the property line of the building which allows patrons to see into some unit owners homes um, my wife and I and many of our neighbors bought our properties under the assumption that we were safe from developers because we sit next to a more than 160 year old beautiful historic church and graveyard that is listed on the US National Register of Historic Places um, if the proposal is approved hotel guests will overlook the views south facing units severely compromising our privacy we will experience not only extensive noise pollution but light pollution and potential trespassing from clients of the hotel restaurant bar and cafe which is proposed to operate 365 days a year um, again you know this is not a high density urban um, living zone it is a residential area um, here are some questions that we had we'd like to have answered um, some have already addressed but why haven't they reached out to the view to present their plans and address our concerns how will they enforce the 198 maximum capacity how will they ensure their clients do not trespass on our property whether our parking or walking on our land how will they manage rowdy late night crowds how will they effectively disperse them once an event is over at 10 p.m. on weekdays and 10 30 p.m. on weekends um, will there be no smoking rule for the entire property including outside will they prohibit outdoor music speakers amplifiers what steps will they take to ensure their lighting does not cause light pollution for our four residential complexes um, which would be the view River Ridge Hammond Plaza and um, the West End Lofts, and specifically, um, you know, for the residents overlooked by the hotel, will they fund new fencing surrounding the entire property, including on the boundary line between the hotel and the beginning of the view's property? Will they install sound insulation? Um, what are their plans to ensure the grave graveyard is not destroyed or demolished? And to me, most importantly, how will they protect the habitats of animals that live and rest in and around the graveyard? And that includes deer, groundhogs, rabbits, migratory birds, and raptors. And, and as Shelley said, we are not against any development of the church. It just has to be an appropriate development that is respectful of, of, of the neighborhood. Um, as it stands now, Gavin and Prophecy Theater are the ones that stand to gain from this project. We all lose. Thanks very much. Thank you. Alex Rivers, uh, to Academy Place, uh, Academy Street, lived directly across from the uh, uh, proposed project. Um, I do have to say, Gavin has been uh, transparent, reached out to me directly, my family, coming over, make personal contact as far as his ideas and plans for it. So I know that some have spoken that he hasn't been in contact with me, with them, but in the neighborhood, I've been in contact, and he's been very transparent with what he is proposing. Um, I'm. Honestly, on the fence, I came here to be open-minded to hear about all the possibilities of what could happen. There are excellent points, excellent questions that I didn't even consider yet when having conversations with Gavin. I do think that the drilling down and the making definite goals, definite punch list, definite criteria that has to be uh, upheld. The parking consideration, I'm sure there's a lot of smart individuals around here who will figure that out. Um, the traffic that actually coming in when you have the amount of traffic, we've all been out, you know, going home Friday night from the Metro North, you know how um, uh, Wilcock can get backed up, that's we can be a consideration. I, I just feel like, you know, with the scope that I'm seeing it now, it's getting a little bit more bigger than I had imagined it. So it's just now it's the number of people that are coming in and out, how is that going to be managed and controlled? I am in favor of arts. I am in favor of having a venue of some sort or the repurposing of some uh, of a historic church in that way. It's just making sure that it's managed in a more uh, in, in a uh, fashion that works for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Pavlock. Dennis Pavlock, Beacon resident. Um, just sitting here listening to this application uh, tonight, um, when, the, when, the, when the funeral home has a funeral, and I, I've seen it, it's, some of them are quite large. So if they have an event for 198, and if funeral home has a funeral going on for 198, 
there's your traffic, more traffic congestion there. And as a, as a uh, person uh, who has parking lot experience, uh, maintained parking lots for the last 13 years, I can tell you people are gonna, anything they have in their car, fast food cups, burger containers, garbage in bags, they're gonna just throw it, get out of their car, they're gonna throw it on the ground, they're gonna take off. Uh, that I can tell you. Um, what I heard here tonight was a, was I thought was a, um, when I was always involved and, and I was always had uh, representing people, and John, you know that as well as John, you know that as well. I always told the people what they wanted to, wanted to hear, not what they should hear. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Anyone else? Rifkin, Ten River Ridge Court. So, um, my husband, Amanda, you're, you've been amazing. I submitted his letter very last minute, so I'll just read it again. His name is uh, Del Brooks, a resident. Wait, which way? This way? I'm yeah. short, but I yeah, feel long. Okay. My name is Del Brooks, resident of River Ridge. I previously articulated my oral concerns at the previous town hall meeting on June 14, 2022. And I've not changed. Wait, I am sure. Okay, and I've not changed my position since. Due to public safety concerns, i.e., in my opinion, the venue is prone to a calamity. For example, if there is a fire at the designated commercial premises, while at full capacity, it's obvious that only access by the fire and police departments, including EMS services, would be from off of Walcott Avenue created a potential human property disaster due to limited accessibility by our first responders. Additionally, the venue will accelerate pedestrian foot traffic, which further creates and heightens public safety concerns of pedestrian vehicle knockdowns. Which, walking the streets here, it's become very dangerous, so I can say that. Case in point, Manhattan has recently taken pedestrian safety into consideration by reducing vehicle traffic footprint, thus reducing the frequency and severity of the pedestrian industry. In closing, we should not be dismissive, I'm going too fast, I'm sorry, or discount the historic significance, nor the, and I agree with all this, nor the religious, social acceptable symbolism of the adjacent cemetery. It's very easy to imagine the hooligans, people partying, I'm just gonna now take it, and you know, the thought of, I do like a cemetery. They're apparently the who's who of Beacon. And to have just people desecrating those stones, it is disheartening. It is very easy to imagine hooligans attending a concert while drinking, among other things, desecrating the Holy Land. Thank you for the opportunity allowing me to voice my concerns as a resident of Beacon, literally residing with my life next door to the church, regarding this commercial proposal and as elected officials, I'm sure you will heed to the will of the people and overlay the overreaching concerns of public safety, not to mention the potential sound decibel levels and its adverse effect to the surrounding ecosystem, not limited to only humans. Respect, respectfully, Dale E. Brooks. Thank you. So, no. And oh, then- Do more? Yes, for me now. From Rachel Rifkin, his wife. Oh. I was just reading his thing. Calamities. Fair. Okay. okay. Sorry, I'm just, not good at this. I'm getting better. Okay. I'll just make one, one observation. We're not elected officials. We're appointed volunteers. Okay. So and I thank you for I just want that. everybody to be okay, I'm absolutely sorry. clear. Well, that's good you were listening. I didn't go too oh. fast. So A, as living next door to the applicant site, I do not want, as a residential homeowner, a, site, a sign on my property and lawn that says concerts going. Let's just do that. That's going to ruin our lawn that we've fought so hard to make. I mean, it's impossible to make any lawn nice with, unfortunately, the heat. Um, B, I don't know the applicant's history in terms of development and construction. Because if you take a historic site, if you take a historic site, you really need good. It's not, and I'm not, even to do a three-family site building, that's a lot of work. So let's think about that. I don't know how he's going to build underneath the infrastructure. Um, 
And then also, I think it's actually, sorry, I think it's almost, I'm not, not, I'm not, it's almost rude to even say park in municipal hall. So you're going to say park at the government official building where the police are? So if I want to have a rager, which we did when I was in high school in a small town, um, we didn't say go park at Municipal Hall Plaza, um, if that makes any sense. It's like right where the police are. You're bound to just get caught. We, we follow. What? <laughs> we follow. Yeah, okay, makes sense. so if, if I have a rager, I'll just say go park at the police station. And it's, you know, and, and I do see there is, anyway, hopefully you can just see. And the hotel, 30-room hotels, I don't know if it still has one operator, but I don't know how that works. And then if we still have only 10 attendees for the now reduced thing, I still don't understand how that works. But thank you all so much. Thank you. And I don't want to be coming here and getting better and better. <laughs> Great job. Anyone else? Jane Miley for Stratford Avenue. There's been a lot of discussion about the historic church, and I'm not being, um, I'm not trying to be smart, but what's going to be left once this group gets into that church, tears it apart, makes sure that there's uh, soundproofing, what's going to be left of the primary building after you're all done? Can we see it before and after? Can we see it before and after? What are you going to have left? I don't understand this. It's a historic building, and you're going to go in there and rip it apart. We know you're going to do that. You have to, to make it work for you. Can we have an on-site review of the building with the building inspector? Thank That's you. a question. Who do I ask? We, we've made it up. Just FYI, I guess we've made it the case in point that we don't dialogue during the public no. comments. So, we okay. listen, so it's not that we're ignoring you, but we... We want to just listen to your comment, and then but it'll. Who do I go to discussion. to make the request? It's the historic church. Please send a please send us a comment letter, and I, I want to also say we read the letters. I've read every letter that's been forwarded to us via email, and so just FYI. I have to send a letter. I'm making a public request, oh, yeah. but I got to follow up with make an the, email. You make the and you don't have to, but if you would like to, you can follow up with a letter. But you've made your comment, so and we'll. You, you've posed a question. The applicant can very. You know, willing if they would, or, forgive me. If they are willing, they they're um, more than welcome to answer your question. Um, but yes, we don't necessarily either double dip. This is the second time up, so thank you. Nor do we engage in exchange of Q and A with the public. So that's a policy. Um, we appreciate your comments, and we take all comments seriously. seriously. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No more double dipping. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, I think we're I think we're clear. That's it. We've just asked. The, we appreciate all the time and the comments from the public. And, and again, we're still working through all the pieces here. We've heard it all tonight. We're we'll see you again soon. And thank you for your time. We just ask that the board continue the public hearing too. We'll do. We're going to keep the public hearing open. Okay. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a quick two-minute break. We don't usually. Yeah, thank you. We're going to reconvene. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, let me just make sure I announce your application. Uh, we're here at our second agenda item. If I can get this thing to work, uh, this will flow smoothly. Um, we're here uh, with this application uh, at continued public hearing for secret and environmental review on this application for special use permit, site plan approval, and subdivision, Mirbo Inn and Spa. Good evening. Correct. Good evening. Uh, I'm Ed Kellogg. I'm with uh, Mirbo. And we just wanted to spend a couple minutes updating you on some of the, um, the details that we've um, included in our last submission for, for the site plan. Uh, a lot of cleanup items, really. Um, so if we go to the, uh, the master plan, Mike, um, really nothing substantial has changed here other than a couple of things we wanted to point out. Um, um, <coughs> we've corrected the 
access point where formerly Craig House Lane meets, uh, which will be Mirabeau Lane, meets Grandview right there. So we've cleaned up some vegetation and the detailed plans will show that. Um, other, other than that, at the south end, we've cleaned up a couple of notes in that subdivision parcel, but nothing else. Um, if we go to the next site plan, Mike. So this is really, um, you know, again, some cleanup. Uh, the entrance circle, there was some circulation issues. So as you come in off of 9D and you approach the entrance circle, uh, you'll be able to go and drop off your luggage or drop off your guests at the front door or head to the west to the parking areas. Um, and then if you're coming from the west, um, you'll be able to more easily pass um, through the entrance circle and then head back out to 9D. So we've cleaned up a lot of the geometry there and opened that up um, and added some signage as well. Um, <clears throat> the entrance, uh, the exit lane out to 9D is now single lane. That was one of the comments from uh, uh, the last meeting uh, that was included in, in the submission. Um, <clears throat> down at the west parking lots, uh, you know, again, we've tried to play with uh, or keep the existing grades where they used to have the carriage house and the barn there. Uh, so that's, you know, there's a lot of geometry there that's a, um, a little bit tricky, but uh, for the most part, we've cleaned up that. We've really tried to eliminate as many retaining walls as we can, working with the existing grades. So uh, we think we've accomplished that. Um, I guess back to the master plan, Mike, sorry about that. Um, there was a comment about sight lines, um, you know, coming along Mirabeau Lane where the cottages are. And um, Colliers, you know, did an analysis of sight lines and I think for the most part it's 130 feet in both directions, um, which really can allow for a 20 mile per hour speed limit. Uh, we're gonna have posted 15 miles per hour speed limit. We just want, when people come off 9D, we just want you to, uh, from any direction, just everything gears down. So that'll be 15 miles an hour on the entire site. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, you know, again, signage we've cleaned up. Um, yeah, other than that, nothing really substantially has changed on the site plan, you know, since the last time um, we were in front of you. Uh, there's um, a lot of engineering comments, you know, for John Russo that uh, with the water and sewer report and SWIP and things like that, that we need to address uh, we've addressed a lot of those, but there, we'll continue to refine that and include it in, in the next submission. Um, yeah, we, there was one, one question John had about cut and fill analysis. We're going through that right now as well, but you know, we will have a balanced site. And the flexibility we have is in the, uh, the ponds that are part of the Monet Gardens. Um, they're kind of shaped like amoeba. But you know we can morph the amoeba shape and change the depth of the pond so that we're not exporting or importing any fill. Uh, there'll be select fill for the utility trenches, things like that. But you know there won't be any fill to make up grade. I, th I think I'm also looking at phasing for the site as far as the construction material, where you're cutting from, where you're moving to, how much is actually going to be open at a given time. That all lends towards your erosion sediment control. Right. The site. And Mike included that in the submission. Um, yeah, in terms of overall phasing for the master plan, it's all about just you know just the initial resort, you know, not any of the other future phases. But and we won't be disturbing anything, um, you know, along Grandview for a while, anyways. But and we'll be back in front of you for any site plan review for that. Yep. Um, <clears throat> We have spent some more time on our uh, view sheds along 9D, and we had the opportunity to discuss this with John, but uh, Henry Thomas with LRC can walk us through that. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I'd like to touch on, actually, if you could go back to that first landscape plan. I just wanted to touch on a couple of landscape items not that far back, let's see. There you go. Uh, so the landscape plans have been uh, much more fleshed out uh, than previously. And I wanted to mention that because there's a, a number of elements that relate directly to the considerations of views and view sheds that we've accounted for, or started to account for in the development of the landscape plan. Uh, 
and there's sort of four big pieces. One is you can notice that uh, along the entrance drive and for that, that area between there and the building that there's a lot of foreground that isn't populated with a lot of dense planting. And that's specifically in response to the idea of keeping that view large and expansive. Uh, we have shown some new trees in the landscape. So I think that's something we'd like to certainly get some feedback on. The idea is that we're also complementing a historic landscape and building for the future. So uh, your guidance or reaction to that would be helpful. Second thing is that we spent uh, some concentrated time along that parking that is adjacent to Route 9D and spent a lot of time in deep detail with plant materials and a little bit of earthwork and, and uh, notching in a bit of a wall adjacent to that second curb cut with the intention of creating those sections that we presented as design intent previously in terms of using earthwork and landscape to soften, mitigate, screen the parking. Uh, third element is going farther along the hotel uh, chateau to the left. Uh, that's an area where there's a lot of existing st street trees. There's other small scattered trees in that front yard. And so the plan has been populated with a lot of infill in there to provide additional screening and buffering, uh, hopefully in a way that's more natural and casual rather than a strong rigid buffer but one that's sort of complementary to the casual or informal style of the property in general uh, and the fourth element is just to highlight uh, sort of a string of garden if you will or a string of landscape that goes all the way from the western parking lot across the front of the hotel and along the front or the street side of the hotel bar and uh, that's sort of, we've, we've really developed that as a common thread uh, that we think ties one end of the site to the other in terms of this immediate hotel area. Uh, those all contribute to the, uh, the view considerations that we've got in the next couple of slides. So Mike, go ahead and advance. Uh, we've included the next couple of landscape sheets, but we don't have to speak to those. So if you could go to that first view. One more. Oh, I'm sorry, two more. <laughs> okay. Uh, this view was what we were describing as the secondary primary view from the street side of things. And uh, previously we had presented this existing condition. And if you switch then to the next slide, Mike, uh, we presented at the last meeting this rendering, which was starting to talk about and show the nature of the landscape between the street and the building. Uh, we had some dialogue with John about the nature of that plant material, and although it wasn't submitted, we do have a working version of a revision uh, that's the next slide where we've shown use of broadleaf evergreen, specifically an inkberry is what I think we use, a ver a several different varieties of inkberry so that we have an all season kind of, uh, of, a, of an edge, but it's uh, a little softer than evergreens and um, uh, a, a little different or a little gentler texture than evergreens, if you will, needled evergreens, I mean. Um, so the idea would be that we get more height out of those than we had previously suggested. Uh, we'll continue to cut detailed sections through there and coordinate that with planting so that as we show one or the other that they are tied together. So I'm confident we can continue to flesh that out uh, so that as you see in this view, the parking is sort of behind all that stuff, but yet the mansion is in the distance. One other, uh, switching to the next slide, Mike. One other view that we'd uh, been asked to respond to, and this was in our submission package, was uh, the view south from the mansion uh, if you came out the back door or the back uh, entrance looking south and in, in effect you're looking down that big bowl and the trees that you see in the distance sort of in the middle of the photograph are adjacent to the watercourse that comes down from Route 9 
and there's that one little sliver of, of lawn that you see right almost dead center in the photo. That's where Mirbo Lane curves around and heads back south. It makes that S curve and then goes south. So uh, just to get yourself grounded in terms of what you're looking at, uh, the next slide <coughs> will show you what that view is. Again, we're standing on what was the porch but would be now a, a new deck, deck uh, from the mansion. On the left is the chateau, what we're calling the chateau portion of the hotel. On the right, that uh, volume is the uh, conferencing facility. And underneath, the foreground that's flowers and grasses, that's the roofscape over what we call the grotto rooms below. And so we've got paved terrace, then green roof, and then to the left of that, you can see the pond gardens starting to reveal themselves. Way out in the center of that image, right where that cursor was, that's again those trees that are at that water course coming down. So cottages number four and five are uh, out beyond that. So they will have, at best in the wintertime, a very filtered view of, of those cottages from here. Cottages one through three are almost directly off the line of that conferencing space, but they are two things. One, they are down, and, and two, because of the roof terrace from this point of view, they are below the sight line. Even the roof is below the sight line from this point. If you walked out to the far end of the terrace, they would start to reveal themselves because you're getting far enough out forward that they become uh, visible. Um, so that's some of the stuff that's evolved uh, since we left last time, I think. I'll turn it yeah, back the, to Ed. Uh, from... the, the peak of the roofs for cottages one, well, go to the next, the next view, Mike, with the uh, plan. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So with the plan, you can see this V, and if there's a straight line from the west side of the dining wing, and if you carry that out, those cottages one, two, and three are on the other side of that, of that line. Uh, and the, the peak of the roofs of those cottages are at the same floor elevation as the dining wing, which is the same floor elevation as the mansion. So the view is from the south porch. And you can see cottages four, or, uh, four and five are about five to 600 feet away from the south porch. So it, it's quite a ways away. Um, and I hope that portrayed you know, what we were trying to, to show. But, and, but it's important also the revised view with the heavier low plantings from 9D, that was not in the submission and it will be. You know, that's a progress print that um, uh, it's not something, uh, you know, you would comment, you can comment on it, but it wasn't included in the package, but it will be. Um, that's the highlights of what we wanted to talk about. You know, we. Yeah, I think, you know, Dan, uh, Larry spoke with Jennifer, but, uh, you know, if there's an opportunity to close the secret public hearing tonight um, and maybe set a public hearing date for the site plan and special use permit, but that's, that's on our list of requests. Yep, but, sure. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so we are board still in open secret public hearing. Um, you did touch on a few things germane to secret, specifically view sheds that we want to just make sure that we're settled on, right? Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I'll ask John to share his observations just relative to your back and forth recently on that and other aspects of your application. Okay. John? Yeah, my primary uh, concerns about the public views were from Route 9D because there's some good shots of the mansion that I don't want to see lost. And uh, there's now, there's right, Currently, there's two view spots, but you're actually going to create a third because you're moving the driveway to the north and taking out a mound and some landscaping, so you're going to have a broader view on the north end than you do now. Yeah, and I think there was uh, the five uh, pink trees, you know, that they are in the they're in the view of uh, of uh, this perspective right here. Right. This, but this is actually the new view that you described that you don't presently have. Okay. Yeah. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I just pointed out that 
some of those low plannings weren't high enough yeah. to block the parking lot, and they look like they're working to correct that. And I also identified, I think, five or six trees, newly planted proposed trees that are going to be in the middle of that view sheds. And so by moving them to the left or right a little bit, you can frame the view rather than yeah. block the view as those grow up. Right. Um, so that's, that was my main concern. The, the other things that are hanging out on my letter are the, um, I think the, the applicant should initiate a conversation with the Greenway Trail Committee to talk about uh, their desire to have a um, creek front um, path yeah. and, um, and maybe to, to uh, consider a path along uh, Grandview and South Avenue that frontage so that the South Avenue Bridge, when it's, when it's reconstructed, would be able to connect the, the Fjord Trail and the, and the Greenway Trail along the uh, west side of the creek with the settlement camp and the mountains. So there would be that sort of loop connection up, up uh, Grandview and south. Um, I think those are something that I'd like to hear the Greenway Trail Committee's input on um, and see how you know, we can start dialogue with them because their views are always relatively important to the planning board in terms of the overall trail systems. Um, and the other item was if indeed you do have a connection, maybe even if not uh, up Grandview, um, there's a sidewalk along Route 9D. I'd like to see a, a crosswalk to the park across the street, the Settlement Camp Park. Uh, because presumably people here on this property might want to go over there uh, and 9D could use a crosswalk there from the sidewalk across the way anyway. Uh, this, this entrance and, and uh, due use can provide that opportunity. I hope to, to make that area um, a little bit more connected in terms of trail and crosswalk and sidewalk systems. Thank you. Just curious, as far as the Greenway, tra Greenway Trail Committee's uh, overture, um, we haven't heard from them at all. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so they they just expressed their interest. To, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think you have to meet, reach out to them. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, they have a history of coming in late to the process, and we're trying to encourage them to come in yeah. earlier on the process. And so, reaching out to them and offering an invitation to have a meeting or whatever. Yeah, okay. I think is the way to get the ball rolling so it doesn't yeah. come in as a later surprise. Yeah, we can, yeah. Okay. We're obviously we've expressed our concerns about that, but uh but yeah, we will. Well, and and also the crosswalk at at nine D, um yeah, it's uh you know, people are driving, you know, faster than they should. We're gonna have the left hand turn northbound, so there's a lot going on right there that uh, yeah, so we'll take a closer look. Under consideration, great. Thank you. John. So the applicant has done considerable work on engineering. Uh, they've submitted an updated water and sewer report, storm water report, and they've done a lot of work uh, on the design plans themselves. We still have a number of comments that we're flushing out with them and, and uh, getting things cleaned up. Uh, so they're progressing towards that. So there's nothing major at this point. That's glaring, but there are a lot of comments to be addressed still. As far as their SWIP, um, just scan and scanning your notes. Um, needs some update re relative to soil testing. They've done some soil testing out there. They're doing. Infiltration. They have very good soils for doing infiltration of the stormwater on the site. Um, they had rain gardens previously proposed. DEC only allows a certain area of collection to those, so they're going to bioretention. But I'd like to see if we can go to some sort of infiltration at those locations also. So it may require some additional soil testing uh, being performed at those locations. Okay. <clears throat> but n nothing of concern relative to secret as far as no yeah. no I, they're they're doing better than most yeah huh hi Mark thank you <laughs> <laughs> makes me think what the other applications yeah and the, the lighting and the plan landscaping plans I thought were very thorough and I didn't have any trouble with the lighting plan 
Great, so thanks. It was just the landscaping in the entrance area that I was concerned about. Yeah, when, when I look at a, a tree removal plan and notice that you've put an X over and marked fallen trees, that's, that's pretty comprehensive. Anyway, um, thoughts around the board, questions or comments before we go to the public? Yes, could you speak to um, Gatehouse Lane and where it meets Grandview? Do you ha are you going to gate that? Is it going to be used? Could you speak to that intersection? Yeah. I know the community is concerned about traffic. Yeah, so the South Gatehouse, um, we'll, we're going to clean up the exterior just like we are with the Tyrone to school. You know, fix the landscaping, make sure everything is stabilized. Uh, you know, they all have plywood windows that are with painted paint. So we'll clean that up, but it's not part of this development. That's actually at the western edge of that future subdivision triangle. You know, it's like a seven acre parcel, but there won't be access through Gatehouse Lane. When, this, when the rental cottages, you know, down the road um, are developed, uh, then that will be active, but, um, but not, not as part of this phase. Yeah, um, Craig House Lane, you know, will be, which is where the corner where the farm is. So future date uncertain, uncertain. in regards to, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, our, you know, I mean, our schedule still is hopefully, you know, we're through this process this fall, you know, late fall and, uh, you know, start demolition in February and open in the summer of 24. You know, that, but that's all about, you know, the mansion, the chateau and those five initial cottages. Yep. Okay. Ah, excuse me. You're back there in the... <laughs> I actually didn't have any. Our, our comments uh, have to do with the site plan review. I, I was going to say, though, that their traffic study that they prepared um, did forecast the cottage, the, the traffic impacts of the cottages um, and their access. My understanding is that they would access the gatehouse lane from Grandview Avenue. Um, so they have looked into that, even though right now it's a phased or a forecasted uh, plan. But. Yeah, our, our, our comments don't have to do with secret review if that's what we want to stick to. We just want to understand the traffic circulation on site and our comment letters. Yeah, and the, you know, these future cottages, I mean, they're part of the whole rental program. You know, so a lot of these guests, they're going to come to the front door, check in, and then drive internally. They're not going to go back out at 90. So they're coming dump. from a different direction. Yeah, I mean, whether, whether they still have to check in, so whether they're coming from the south or from the north, they're going to have to come to the front door of the mansion to check in. So from that point, they'll just, st they'll just go around the side of the mansion and head down, to, down Gatehouse Lane as opposed to going back out on 90 and taking a right on Grandview. So there's a lot of internal circulation. Yeah. Would you consider limiting access from Gatehouse Lane, you know, with a as an emergency access or do you do you need to use it for the cottages it seems like they can you know come in and out the main entrance they it was it's a very circuitous route if we force them to come you know then we're introducing more traffic in in front of the mansion and conflicting with other guests so um, but again this yeah is, well is, is is as far as your application now in relationship to activity on that lane, it, it's it's overgrown with trees. Nothing nothing will happen on Gatehouse Lane. So, and, and limited until you come back and we right. talk about that second part of your application. Right. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. 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 We may you know clean it up so people can walk on it, but yeah. it's not you know no vehicles or anything. There's no activity down there. Got it. So, is there a secret review for Phase Two, like separately? Just like any yeah, other application. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll come okay. back in for, you know, a few, a few more reviews. And then one other question, on, uh, just on the landscaping, very detailed question um, at this stage of the game, perhaps. But um, you have planting on the, the northeast side of um, the northernmost parking arc, but there's a there's a gap where if, if you're standing at the mansion looking into the field, perhaps you see the parking lot. Right. Yeah. The 
there's a big space in the center that is a set of beech trees. If you, it's a big white space. Yes, that's where the sidewalk right, goes around. Right, sidewalk goes around. There's right. a big cluster of existing beech trees that is very dense in there. So that is not actually a void. Is that the is that No, the just north vision? of the sidewalk that's, that's around the... Right. And then oh, you so have that island. Through that, through yeah. that little gap. Mm -hmm. I got you. Um, yeah, we could wrap that a little farther. Yeah, we could look at that. You mean at the end of the crescent line? Yeah, it's sort of just above well. the cursor. Yeah. 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 It, yeah, we were primarily at that point, I'm sorry, uh, <clears throat> separating that from the tent venue area that we were, had shown on the plan. Uh, yeah. So it was the view going toward the parking instead of the other way around. Okay, thank you. And we don't want to block, we don't want to totally block the view of that expansive lawn either. I just, yeah, I understood. Okay. Anything else, Karen? That's it. Yeah. Um, Jill's not here tonight, but there was a, a comment raised by Jill in some kind of follow up after the architectural review board meeting about you know, just um, kind of softening the, the visual impact of the hotel as potentially like a more kind of Georgian structure versus the existing house, you know, as a, as a gothic, kind of a different style. And I'm just wondering if, if there's a plan to have plantings on the east side of the ponds. And I'm looking, I'm thinking about the, the rendering, and I know we can't get too serious about renderings, but the rendering that you showed looking south. And I was just thinking, you know, that might be a way to sort of soften the transition between the existing building and the different style of the hotel. Yeah, I will say that in that area of that rendering, yes, that pond garden will have substantial amounts of landscaping and actually sort of bridging that transition between the site and the building because there's some slopes that go up against it and walls. Uh, so there is a substantial more <laughs> amount of landscape to go in that, in that pond garden. So you're talking about in the V between between the ponds and the hotel. I should be cautious yeah. about basing a question on a rendering, but the south facing rendering, it looked like the east side of the pond was just lawn yeah. sloping up to the yeah. hotel. No, like, that, yeah, that looks stark, man. No, we just did that very lightly, but I, yeah, that's gonna have substantial amounts of detail and landscape in it. And then yes. thank you. Then would be represented on your plan your landscaping. Correct. Yeah. Uh, that area we've we've started to dive in in terms of the plans here, but we're and we're diving in much more aggressively now internally in there, knowing that that wasn't sort of the, the first and foremost uh, view issue, but we are working our way into that. Yeah, so. while we were talking, I was just looking at, yep. at some Monet yep. Garden pictures and realizing how the right fringe can really soften the base of a building and, uh, and would probably just really kind of smooth out you know, the potential transition between two yeah. different styles. I would say the applicant concurs on that. Thanks. Okay. That's great. We're not going to go from from pond to grass, right? I mean, if you if you get the I opportunity mean, to look at the based other based on everything uh, you're showing us, I wouldn't have imagined, but it just kind of. No. I mean, the other properties they're very substantial and mature plantings all around the ponds. Okay. Kevin, anything? Um, okay. uh, good work. I'm. <laughs> I'm pleased with everything I'm seeing, uh, although I, there, there seems to be some changes and that I uh, look forward to examining a little closer just so I understand it better. Okay. Great. Okay. So um, as mentioned, we're at um, Secret uh, Public Hearing. So anyone from the public who'd like to share their thoughts or comments, please do. Clark Edmund to Wilson. I'd like to re also return to this economic proposition of what's going on here in terms of land use and the benefits to the city uh, being this fact that this is a commercial project. <laughs> First of all, congratulations to the, to the team that's presenting. It's awesome. I don't think we've seen something so complete in years in the city of Beacon, perhaps. I'm wrong, but uh, it seems pretty impressive. So the issue is not particularly against the establishment of the resort. But I think the issue is, I think the, the planning board may be just an error in just a small part of it, and that is the bifurcation of the real estate for the general assemblage that presents the project upon completion in two phases. 
what happens when when a project like this is bifurcated from commercial use to like residual um, a residential use is that the land is parked and the ability to tech to collect real taxation on the value of the land and how it purports to perhaps contribute to additional expansion or or residential usage of a certain density what happens is is that the land it continues to be probably assessed at, at, at two acre zoning because that's the current zoning. And so when you're changing part of the project and then favoring the other part, knowing full well that it's not ever going to be built as two acre zoning, it becomes kind of farcical. And so I'm, I'm just trying to bring to the planning board's attention that taxation and generation and of commercial entities in the city of Beacon needs to be examined from the perspective of maximizing the opportunity for economic development, jobs, as well as taxation that is not residential in scope, but helps to contribute to any imbalance that may exist with collection of school taxes. So when you have an opportunity to seize the moment, I think the, 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 the planning board should should recognize that have you maximized the ability for the city to collect commercial taxation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you, please. Please come up. Hi, um, my name's Millie Solomon and I'm a neighbor um, in, the, in the neighborhood where this project is going in. And I'm excited about it. I support it. I think it's a, it, it's been a, the Craig Estate has been in ruin for a very long time, so I'm very positively inclined. But I wanted to talk about three things. Um, trees, noise, and community benefit. Um, in regard to trees, there's been a lot of discussion about new plantings, but that lawn is filled with really beautiful and some very unusual trees. So I would want to, I would recommend that an independent arborist have a chance to look at, at those trees and decide how best to preserve what's really beautiful there. In terms of noise, I've read that there's going to be um, wedding facilities outdoors with a tent. So I'm concerned about what the noise implications will be. Maybe less for where I live, but more for the, for the other side. Um, and so, again, I would want to see some sort of sound engineering report about, about the noise. I, I think it would be really an imposition on the neighborhoods on both sides to have lots of weekend noise outside in what is now a very peaceful and beautiful neighborhood. And then I wanted to talk about community benefit. And I know it is what I'm going to suggest is not really something that um, is going to come up until the second phase of the project, but I'm afraid if we don't talk about it now, we'll lose all the leverage we have to make it a possibility in the second phase. Um, and that is that the Tiaranda School is, was originally a swimming pool on the first level. And it would be an incredible asset for the city of Beacon if we could create an indoor pool in addition, we have the high school pool, but it has very, very narrow uh, window of opportunity. I know many people who would want to take advantage of this. This commercial project is great, but it's also benefiting from the public uh, asset of the, of the park across the Fishkill Creek. It's part of the value of that property is that it's uh, just across the Fishkill Creek to the, to the Madam Brett Park and the Fjord Trail. And so, could we think really creatively about a way to encourage the developers to create some kind of public, you know, to make a commitment to restoring a pool that people could do indoor swimming? It would be a recreational asset um, during the winter months. We have that asset in the summer across the street from this property in the new pool, but we have no place for the community to swim except for very, very limited hours at the high school. So um, that's, my, that's my pitch. Thank you. Just mm -hmm. for the record and for Amanda's benefit, I'm, you, what's your address? 15 High Gold Lane. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, my name is Deborah Felder, and uh, I was asked by a, one of my neighbors. We're a little bit south of Craig House and the what, development there. What's your address, ma'am? Your Riding address. Riding Ridge Trail. Five Ridge Trail. Riding Ridge Trail. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Is there going to be a turning lane on 90B? 
because we have the university settlement across the street, and then you'll have the uh, Maribel, is that it? Maribel? Okay. Maribel there. Will there be a turning lane so that people can get in and out, and, and the, because the traffic gets very heavy uh, towards the end of the rush hour on 9D? So I wanted to know about that. Uh, the other thing is I had spoken to Dan Bland, who's the person for uh, four where we live, District 4, and my request was that there be a 25 mile per hour speed limit on Slocum Road going into Grandview, but I heard someone tonight say something about 15 miles an hour, so what's going to happen? That's inside the site itself. That 15 mile per hour speed limit was only inside. Is inside Maribo. So the 25 will still be Grandview into Slocum, because that was a request and he sent me an email that that was that. Yeah, just to be clear, the, per the planning board has no purview over okay. speed limits. Well, the state did say that they're going to make it 25. That was a request I made. Uh, the other thing is um, the passage to the spa, is that where the Tiaranda School is? How will they get from up where the Craig so House is to the, to the Tiaranda so School? So you're welcome to ask the questions mm -hmm. and then we'll gather them the applicant is free to answer them if okay. they so desire. Right. So. I was just questioning that. Um, then the last thing is the property owned by Maribo. It extends past that old house uh, that looked like it was a carriage house, the entryway, all the way down to Grandview. Gatehouse, yes. The gatehouse all the way down to Grandview. Yeah, the brick one. Yep. Okay. So, what brick one? That's a. Uh, uh, single house or something that's not a brick house oh, maybe there's a white house right at the gate that sometimes oh, yes. police yeah yes. so the property is from there all the way to Grandview yes a little north of that a little north of that south and then south going down to Grandview okay so you've taken that's your property now right so so ma'am we'll, we'll gather your questions okay so let and me then finish once my you're done okay we'll we'll yeah. see if the applicant wants to that's fine. Address so my question. last question is, um, are they going to make a distinct uh, landscaping something? Because right now it looks unkempt between where the place is and down to Grandview. And so I was wondering when they do the mowing, do they do the mowing all the way to the sidewalk? Or how are they going to handle that with uh, the landscaping that's going to take place? Great. Okay, thank you. Do you want to address any of those questions or? Yeah, please. Thank you. Hi, Mark Torrey, 30 Riding Ridge Trail. Uh, last time I was here, um, I, I questioned the, because it was on the Mirabur website at the time, the, about the 250 I guess uh, event tent which we seem to all have concerns about but uh, as of a couple of days ago or maybe within the last day I see it's it's no longer on the Mirabur website so has that I guess my question is is the 250 guest event tent now you know a thing of the past hopefully um, that was one question uh, second or is it we still talking about 85 85 rooms because um, I, I just I didn't see that on this uh, site plan uh, how many people will the restaurant accommodate uh, and all and this is all leading to basically you know have concerns about traffic um, especially looking at the um, the main entrance way where you have one lane in and one lane out um, our car is going to be making coming north on 9d going to be making a left into that main entrance and cars coming out of Mirbu trying to go north on 90, trying to make a left. That seems like that's going to be a lot going on there that just, just shouldn't be. There's hopefully uh, you can figure out a way to, to make the traffic uh, less hazardous there. And um, so that's, that's a big concern is traffic on 90 because uh, th there's just two lanes, you know, one lane in each direction. And when a car, you know, if a car is going north and trying to make a left, the cars behind them is going to—it's just going to—it's going to go on forever. Um, and it's, again, especially if there's a lot of cars coming out of Mirabu at any given time, especially for a wedding. Um, 
and also um, the the uh, tire on the bridge which I believe has been in the works for years which um, I'm just wondering if that has if there's any if this development by Mirbu will in any way affect the plans for the tier on the bridge um, originally a uh, or for the longest time I've been hearing that it's going to be a you know pedestrian and uh, a bridge for pedestrians and cyclists and emergency vehicles and, that, and that's great but I learned more recently that the existing structure cannot accommodate it and it has to be replaced uh, which kind of blew my mind but anyway I'm just wondering if if with uh, having Mirbu own the you know the bulk of the property nearby uh, is that is the tier on the bridge uh, are those plans going to be affected um, and what else and just a question I meant to ask the last time and I just uh, a place like this is going to use a hell of a lot of water um, I hope somebody has figured out where it's coming from because I didn't think that the reservoirs and beacon were um, bottomless so I hope somebody has that figured out because right now we're in a drought and um, you know a couple of years from now when Mirbu is up and running and you know everyone everyone who walks in and out of that place is going to be showering or or you know one way or another either in the hotel room or in the spa uh, where's all this water coming from so um, you know if we have a drought in the future and it ev inevitably we will the restrictions are going to come much much it seems like they're going to come much sooner um, once this place opens and again I'm totally in favor of this place I want it to happen I think it's a great use of the of the property um, I just want to make sure it's put through the ringer um, by the planning board and it just it gets done right thank you great thank you Teresa Kraft um, the expansive view of the historic site is a majestic experience as people travel by or are lucky enough to stop and visit. Plantings take time to fill in over time. I would like to see the main entry driveway parking lot pulled even further south away from the main view shed of the historic estate. Typically when you pass any parking lot you catch light reflection off the automobiles windows and metals. Is it possible to do sub some subterranean level parking under the spa? I like what we're seeing and hope to see it continued in the softening of the chateau building style. I was going to ask that it be a little reimagined and redesigned since the early design proposals, but they came back with it. I like the revised renderings of the conference structure and hope that that is what's going to set some of the design standards. It does not need to look exactly like their other spa properties to be part of the same company brand. I think this project is special and the spa building has to be set off in a whole different design style so that it does not look like it's trying to mimic the historic architecture of Frederick Clark Withers. I think we should also see a little more of the Richard Morris Hunt music room. But what I do know is it can't be a cookie cutter chateau design style as that too is out of character for this location in the Hudson Valley. I did hear through the historic hotline today that Frank Kowalski is writing another book on the architecture of Frederick Clark Withers and he's a wealth of knowledge and a primary source information and facts. Did I hear the applicant mention a sub 7.5 acre subdivision down the road at the lower buildings by the creek? I'm not sure. I'll have to listen. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Anyone else? Dennis. <coughs> I just have a few uh, concerns. I'm, I'm for the project, uh, so what I've seen so far on some drawings and what I've heard tonight, I just have a few questions. Um, um, going by the property on the right side, south going on 9D, some of the high grass, I know there's no aesthetics going on right now, but if they can manage to cut that high grass down off the right side there going down 90 on the south um, if that can be taken care of it looks kind of a little high there on that one side but however um, I just wanted to also add that uh, is there any uh, were there any existing structures prior to uh, even before you got the property or prior to the other owners owning it 
Uh, were there any structures that either deteriorated you want to put back on the property outside of the cabins? You want to put back on the property? You want to make it like it was back in the day? I just want to throw that out and ask that. And are you planning to use local contractors for your work? Beacon contractors, uh, Dutchess County uh, uh, contractors to do some of the work there on the property? Um, I believe that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, just because it's so important in terms of safety, we do have a left-hand turn lane uh, northbound um, that's dedicated to go into the site. Um, and also with uh, landscape maintenance, I mean, we're, we're mowing the lawn every week right now and we'll continue to do that even as far down south as Grandview just because we want the whole property to look nice so we'll just continue to maintain that um, you know until we do something down there and then continue to maintain it more but uh, you know, there's a you know, we're, we pride ourselves in our, our maintenance of our properties even while it's being developed and obviously after it's open as well but the left hand turn lane is part of our it's part of our uh, application yep. Yep, and then just for the record, the bridge is not in any way related to your property. No. No. Okay. Um, great. So, yes. I have one more question for you. So, with all this landscaping, what are you doing for irrigation on this landscaping? Well, we'll, we'll have an irrigation system. Yeah, definitely. Are you going to look to reuse stormwater or? Um, no, I think, you know, with the lawn areas in front, you know, we're going to be using, you know, water coming, you know, for the most part out of the building uh, for the irrigation system. Uh, but we are looking at drilling some wells. Um, so all of these ponds, you know, they evaporate every day, you know. So we're thinking so that we don't use, you know, uh, municipal water is that we'll drill some wells to replenish those ponds. Uh, I mean, just a swimming pool will evaporate, especially now, you know, a half an inch, an inch a day. But so that's our plan. But um, but we we are looking at using wells for irrigation as well. Just kind of depends on where it is on the site. When you say water coming out of the building, do you mean gray water reclamation? The what? Gray water? Gray water reclamation. No. Oh. So no, it's just part of part of the municipal no. water. You, you said something about you'll be using for irrigation water, water coming, coming out, out of the, the building. So more or less, they were going to run like a hose to pick it out. So oh. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking all kinds of fancy things. Yeah, yeah I was, I was thinking the same thing. This is water reclamation or water. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and we're, you know, we're going to have two water meter pits, um, so one on Grandview, one on 9D. So the, the site will be circled with water. So if, God forbid, something happened to the main on 9D, you know, we have backup. Got it. But your engineer needs to know about those wells, where they're going. Yep. That needs to be part of the process now. Yep. Okay. And the Department of Health is also right. going to bring that forth. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, regarding that left turn lane on 9D, the plans don't show that, and the traffic study didn't look at that. I, I agree that it would be a benefit to operations of the driveway, but. Um, it's just it's not shown on the plan, so I think we would want to see that and how it's. Well, but it's shown in the Collier's, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's included in the Collier's report. It's not shown on on the in site the plan. Most but recent submission, or in a previous initial submission. submission. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I agree. Right. It was on the initial submission. I thought that y'all had retracted uh, that improvement. Uh, based on the traffic analysis, just showing a shared through left turn lane for that approach. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that, but we're also I'm also talking about the entry lane, that northbound approach on 9D. The most recent uh, synchro analysis shows it being a shared through left, not an exclusive left turn lane. Right. Yeah, you're you're not you're not wrong. We, we the analysis in the synchro doesn't specifically show that separate left turn lane. I mean that th 
theoretically is an improvement, you know. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but the traffic study did analyze whether or not a left turn lane would would be needed there based right. on the left turn lane warrant criteria, and it did show that it was warranted okay. for that location. So that's okay. why we were proposing it. And there is a there is a plan in our traffic study that shows the layout, the potential layout of that left turn. Okay. Lane. And so that's going to be carried over into the site plan itself. Then. That was my question. So, so given that it, it, the, your data warrants it, you're, you're going to adopt that recommendation yeah, and I apply it to your plan. You yeah. know, there's there's going to be a set of construction documents that yeah. will show in detail you know, that left-hand turn lane that will align with the Got entrance it. drive. Okay. Absolutely. The site plan. Also. Right. Yeah. The site plan. Yeah. Right. Construction the documents. Plan. That's what we're saying. That has to appear on your site plan. Right. That has to be part of your site plan. So, as Mike's working on the plans, he's got to incorporate Rich's right. left turn lane yep. and any details associated with that onto the plans for this project. Yeah, yeah. We haven't totally engineered all the drainage, you know, improvements. I mean, all of that was just, uh, but we can include that that on the plan. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Great. So, as far as secret public hearing. And secret itself, we can we can do a couple of things. We can talk about closing the secret public hearing. I think the Eric, recommendation from Jennifer was that we leave it open, leave but it open. you direct us to prepare a resolution. Yeah. Um, I think there are a number of uh, issues that were raised tonight that still need to be hashed out. So leave Fair. the public hearing, the secret public hearing, open, but direct a pre preparation of a resolution for a, a negative declaration. Yeah. Uh, the Great. Thanks, Sarah. Recommendation. Um, that's thoughts on directing uh, Eric and Jen's office on prep of draft neck deck. Any thoughts? That seems to make sense. Okay. Uh, I'll accept a motion to do just that. Motion. Motion by Lynn. Second. Second by Kevin. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then um, we can talk about scheduling site plan and subdivision public hearings. For next month, though, secret needs to be closed before we uh, open that public hearing. Right, but if you have the if you have the resolution, you can vote on the resolution and, and then go right the into yep. at that, the same day. Yep. So thoughts or a motion? So do we need any do we need any further information on some of the the potential tent events, noise, uh, capacity stuff? Before the, we we'll, we'll still we'll today. still have the opportunity to learn more. Yes. So there's, there's nothing about what we're looking to act on this evening that would prohibit us or otherwise inhibit us in learning more about but just those types of things. But they should be prepared to address those issues so that if they want to close the seeker hearing and adopt a seeker in the next deck, they, that should be resolved. Fair. Information should right. be provided for next month. Yeah, so hopefully the applicant is listening. Um, and Mr. Chairman, one other issue that had come up, and I don't know if it was mentioned tonight, tonight already, was uh, whether the um, State um, Historic Preservation Office had submitted uh, comments yeah. um, tonight uh, to the to the we, applicant. Uh, yeah, I mean the, the uh, archaeological report has been submitted, you know, to the city, but it was submitted years ago to SHPO, um, and we have Did not, you ever get, you never, not received. I any think it comments. would be worth reaching out to them to see if they have any comments because we need we'll need that for you know to complete the secret process, I believe. So. Yeah. But is that something that the city? I mean, it was submitted directly to um, Shippo. Um, I'm not sure what year it was, but uh, is that something the city refers it to them, or no, should we just reach, reach directly? You do the submission to them, so you'll have to follow up with them on that. Okay. Yeah, it was already submitted, so we have the file number, so we can do that. I mean, there may have been comments already that just, for some reason, didn't make it into the record. So let's you know, find out what the what the status yeah, is. they did receive the circulation for um, for lead, lead agency. agency. Okay. Um, great. So, any other thoughts on scheduling site plan and subdivision public hearing? I'll accept the motion. Motion. Motion by Kevin. Second. Second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. And then again, the, some of the concerns around potential noise related to events, as far as our um, 
continued review of Secra. Yep. I want to hear back from you on yes. that next month. Great. Yep. Okay. Anything else? No. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Good evening. Okay. Move to the next item on our agenda. This is um, 46 Jetson Street. And hey, John. Clear. Yes. You done? Yeah. We're good. Thank you very much, Star. Uh, <clears throat> Can you guys, if you guys have a conversation to to have, please take it outside. Thank you. Uh, so again, next item on our agenda is a public hearing for secret environmental review on an application for subdivision approval, two lot residential, 46 Jetson Street. Good evening. Oh, hi. Glenn and Watson all from Beatty and Watson. Evening. Um, we're here to have your comments with regard to Seeker. We've recently submitted additional uh, revised plans responding to uh, Mr. Clark and Mr. Russo's comment letters. We got by Mr. Clark, okay, Mr. Russo, we got down to three pages. So that's uh, pretty much of an accomplishment when you consider him. <laughs> three pages. Um, just one sec. Administratively, I want to take care of um, a motion to open the secret public hearing, please. Motion. Motion by Len. Second. Second by Kevin. Was that you? It, it wow. was loud, I know. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, let's, uh, let's talk quickly about just that, our planner and engineer's uh, observations. Anything? We'll start with Mr. Russo, since his are so voluminous, that you'd like to at least highlight. So they did perform an inflow and infiltration study of the site, the existing site. They found that the sump pump is conveying groundwater into the sanitary sewer system. As part of the improvements to the project, they are going to be disconnecting that and putting that into the drainage system. Yep. Uh, have some cleanup on the plans. I also had questions with regards to some of the, uh, some of the testing data. Uh, yes, I saw that. Being Rock. Um, I know it says throughout, but is there any solid ledge rock? I believe it. I believe it's solid ledge. I believe, but I'll we'll check that. Okay, I was just looking at the notes. It just it just makes a general note rock throughout, um, and then there was some overlapping as far as the depths of right. soils. Um, drainage plan. Um, you're picking up the roof leaders. You're bringing them to the drainage system. Same with the footing drain. But I have concerns with where the footing drain is tied. Um, I'd rather see that brought out to the catch basin, so this way if it backs up, the grade is lower than the actual footing drain itself. Otherwise, you'll need to uh, put some sort of backflow prevention device so we don't get water back around the foundation. And then we had some other cleanup details on the plans. Great, thank you. Any questions for the engineer at the moment? No, I understood them. There was one sentence in there, I'll call John about it, that I didn't, I think there was one typo missing that I, I missed the it's word. Probably under the second, second or third paragraph, yeah, there's a sentence I didn't quite understand, yeah. but I'll okay. get back to you on that. Great. Mr. Clark. 
they addressed all my previous concerns. So wow, yeah, wow. Okay, <laughs> you've left John Clark speechless. That's no easy <laughs> task. Um, any thoughts or questions around the board? My, you know, the the one thing that stood out to me was the size of the proposed dwelling in relation to what's in the neighborhood. It seems a little large. What say you? Well, it's <laughs> architecturally designed. It's not that big a building, but it is, it is a little bit bigger than the other buildings. Yes. Uh, I'll talk with the client about it. Uh, I'm just curious. How many square feet does this represent? I think 3, it's. 000. I think it's. I think it's twice 1,500. I think. I. I'd, I'd have to check, but that's what it's, I think. Yeah, it says 3,000 square yes. feet on the. Is that commensurate with the size of residences in that area? I think it's a little bit larger. Yeah. Not much. It looks. It looks deeper than at least the adjacent home. Yes. That's a part of the subdivision. Yeah. Um, it conforms, though? Yes. It conforms. Anything else? I'm just uh, in light in, in regard to uh, John Russo's comment about um, conveying that drainage away from the building foundation or putting in a backflow preventer, I would prefer that the you know just to go to the catch basin and, and do anything you know just do the the best possible solution in terms of you know preventing the potential for drainage to be accumulating around the foundation of the building I, I think that was our intention I think we just haven't shown it correctly um, I'm yeah. glad you've reduced Goodness gracious. I'm glad you've reduced the amount of impervious surface, of, especially in front of the existing uh, structures. Yes. Um, and uh, to the extent you've been able to, I think you've minimized it uh, on, the, on the new development. Um, and uh, my main concerns have been addressed about the groundwater and, and how you've been dealing with that, or, or at least they're being addressed. They've, they've been uh, spoken to. Okay. We'll go to the public then. Anyone here that would like to share their thoughts or comments? Yes, please. Your name and address. Yes, thank you. My name is Caroline Eisner, and I live at 38 Judson. Um, sorry, thanks. 38 Judson. Um, I, Paula, was the contractor on my home, um, and I've been watching what she's doing t with Joe Hockler's property. I have questions about the size. Um, there is the size of the new dwelling is listed at 3,000 square feet, but what's the size of Joe's property? Because that house extends pretty far out, um, and, you, and it does dwarf Linda Weber's house by quite a bit. It goes all the way back to a uh, fire, uh, like a fire patio thing she has. There's also a tree, a really beautiful old um, maple tree, I think, that she has told Linda she's going to cut down, but it's not listed here as being cut down. So I have, a, I have concerns about the kind of um, having worked with Paula. I'm a little concerned about what gets said and then what gets done. Mm -hmm. um, and I, wa I want those things written really clearly. As far as the size of the homes go, if you look at what was done on Churchill, if you look at what was done on Russell, um, those houses don't match the neighborhood. They're very large. They're not of the same ilk. So I, I really want to make sure there's an architectural review. Um, none of the houses on Judson come close to 3,000 square feet. It's just not true. Um, the largest ones might be 2,000. Mine was 1,800. And I had to go in front of the board twice to prove that my house would look the same as others. And all I did was add on to the back um, and I'm, we're just really concerned. The neighbors are very concerned. They're also very concerned about drainage, and I'm glad we're addressing that, because in my property, she put the dry well in the backyard, and by basement floods, every single time there's a bit of rain. We're on a bit of a floodplain, and we really want to make sure that our homes don't flood as a result of poorly done work. So th my last comment is that Dave Buckley, who 
came to my house after I had to do a stop work order, he came and said, these are the things you need to do to get it um, to pass code. He never came back to check. So I want to make sure that whatever you all say gets checked and checked again, and that there aren't promises that are made to do things, and then they're not done. Okay, we, we have some really big concerns on, on our street, and I know that behind, right behind the property, there's some pretty big concerns. There's concerns at the, on the crossroads, that there's gonna be flooding of the houses that are catty corner, because there already is flooding from the street. So we're just really, we're just pretty concerned about what it's gonna do to views. Linda's view is ruined. Um, the trees, the size of the properties, and um, making sure that you all keep everyone to their word about what's going to get changed and what's going to get fixed, because that hasn't been the case um, hmm. in my estimation. Great. Okay. Thank you. I think that's it. Thanks. Okay. Dennis Pavlock, I'm at 34 Justin Street. Um, I disagree with this project wholeheartedly. It's going to not only ruin the, the neighborhood, it's going to destroy its aesthetics, and it's, going to dis and it's going to take my view of the mountain away from we enjoy the, the, look of the, the look of the mountain, and it's going to ruin that view. And if they cut that maple tree down like my other neighbors said here, I'm against that as well. And a lot of, uh, I've noticed a lot of developers and builders, when they got to go into the street, they don't come back and do their due diligence with correcting the street with, with uh, as, a, as the blacktop settles. They do not come back and, and cover that. I had to get that taken care of three, four months. Another developer, builder, had to go through the same thing. I had to go down and keep complaining about putting, of replacing the blacktop that settled in an area in the city. And it's ridiculous. Thank you. Hi, Francesca Coletto, uh, Crescent Drive and Beacon. So I work for Paula as a site manager, and I will be on site here every single day until completion of this proposed project. Um, I've been working with Paula for about a year now, so the last few projects that she's worked on, I've had a very close hand in making sure that everything runs smoothly, everybody is you know, meeting all requirements. I also know we're all here for the same reason, that's because we love Beacon, and I can speak to the fact that Paula truly loves Beacon. Every project she works on, it holds the integrity, the character, the beauty of these houses. I don't think any of them you know, are I don't think that they don't fit in with the block and the character. I mean, Beacon is a creative city, um, and every project that she works on, it just adds to that. Um, I can also speak to that she works with local contractors. She, I mean, there's a reason I'm going to be on site every day, and there's a reason that I'm here tonight. And I do also want to hear all of the residents' concerns and comments. Again, personally, I will be there every day. So I want to hear what's going on, and I want to make sure I'm doing everything that I can to make sure everything goes smoothly, and then we're only adding value to Beacon with these projects. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Okay. I think uh, we're going to keep uh, secret Mr. open. Chairman, yeah. One question for the applicant that I noticed on the, on the EAF, on the full EAF that was submitted, it says partial submission only is requested by city engineer. I think we do want the, the full EAF submitted for the, uh, you know, and, and addressed. I, I don't know why that, whether that was agreed to or not, but it's, I haven't seen that. Well, I'd before, be so. looking for the full thing. With all right. the no, I, we submitted a short form EAF initially, and we was asked for my understanding is, because I wasn't at the last meeting, uh, that we're asked for two specific sections which we submitted. And if, I, if, if that's not what was communicated, I apologize. That's no problem. We were looking for more information related to the whole project with regards to Seeker, because we knew of concerns with the soils, water, so we were looking for a lot more information. So we'd be looking for the full document just to... Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that. 
Great. So one of the reasons why we'll keep secret hearing open. Very good. Um, one other question. I yeah, have. please go ahead. Um, the 48 inch maple tree, that's, I don't know what corner, uh, the east. The, the large maple tree, well, now I did it. <laughs> Um, it looks like it's not being impacted by your grading plan, but um, given the concern in the neighborhood for it and its um, legitimate concern, uh, perhaps we can call out protections. Sorry, Karen, I'm curious. Are you addressing the, um, the maple the, that the was referenced? Inch, yeah, the 48 the, inch the, the maple, maple is right at the on Union Street. Right there. Right there at the south, southeast yeah. corner of the property. Yeah. And we're, we're not going anywhere near it. We could certainly put tree protection around it. Okay. Sorry, ma'am. Okay. So there's also a tree to be removed indicated on your. Yes, there is. There's a, there's a, there are two trees to be removed, actually. One is at the uh, westerly most corner of the property. You'll see, it's on, you'll see it's on the existing condition plan and not on the final condition plan. That tree uh, will go for a couple of reasons. One uh, is that there is a the city requires a site easement and grading along there to maintain that site easement. Uh, and secondly, there's the drainage to catch the um, the groundwater and bring it into the catch basin. We're going to be in, we're going to be affecting that tree. That's not a particularly great tree and, and, and like I said, there's activity that has to happen. The, the other tree that is, it has to, is, is, is a pine tree, which actually is quite a good looking tree, but it, it, it just, it, it, the, the logistics of the thing just won't let it be made. And that's, that's I'm pointing to that with the cursor now. Uh, that's right in the front in the middle of the, it, it interferes with the driveway and, 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 and the access to the house. So that's, so that we're taking off. But <clears throat> Mr. Clark's um, report, he had requested a couple of extra trees. So we have put in, we have put in three trees <coughs> along the a new property line, and we put in two trees along the Union, at Union, along Union, uh, to, to to make up for that. Okay. Just curious, that 48-inch maple is that that's not on your property, is it? I, it's in the public right away. It's in the public right away. It's the one at the this one, the east corner. Yeah, the, yeah. 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 That's yeah. that's the one I noticed. That's a that's a monstrous tree. It's a big yeah big tree. And it's not going anywhere. Yeah. Right. No, but I would I would encourage uh, you know a fence to protect the sure. root zone. We'll put that on the on the erosion con uh, you know on the yeah on thank the you control plan um, at the drip line if advice. possible. Because isn't that where the roots end up? <laughs> Part of it would be. Uh, okay, so thoughts on um, directing Eric's office to draft NAG deck in advance of next meeting in um, the eventuality that the applicant's ready with some of the open items we talked about relative to secret. Any thoughts? Generally okay with that. Motion. Motion. Motion by Karen. Seconded. Second by Lynn. All in favor? Aye. Anything else we can do for you this evening? Can schedule the public hearing on the subdivision. Uh, thoughts? Um, I suppose the same process can be taken if we can adopt the resolution before then yep. the public hearing can go forward if you believe you have sufficient information to open that public hearing. Yeah, I mean, I think we do, but you do know if we schedule and you're not ready for secret, then that gets pushed off. Understood. Okay. Thoughts? Motion to set up a public hearing for next month? Uh, how close is John? John, do you feel like the information that you've asked for the I full? I think Lynn will have all the information. Okay. So then I'm okay with it. You're threading the needle here. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Motion. Motion. Motion by Len. Second. Second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Good night. You're welcome. Have a good night. Okay, next item on the agenda. Uh,
31 Beacon. This is a public hearing on application for special use permit approval and site plan approval, accessory apartment 31 Beacon Street. Good evening. Good state, evening. State your name and address for the record. Please. Yeah. Uh, but first. Let me just hook in here. Um, Jennifer always catches me on this. Uh, motion to open public hearing. Sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to hear from the applicant first before you moved. Before no, you moved. she usually tells me to do it right away. Chop, okay. chop. Motion. So, motion by Karen. Seconded. Second by Len. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'm, ass I'm assuming that's because the public hearing will also capture, I don't know. Sometimes what? you do it with the introduction and then it's just to get the public comments. Yeah. So, so. Thank you. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, so the property is at 31 Beacon Street. Um, the owner is proposing to create an accessory apartment at the lower level of the house. We, we um, submitted revised drawings based on the comments we got from the board and consultants last month. Um, and I, I believe there's just a couple of minor comments left. And I, I think that you asked the city attorney to draft a resolution to review tonight. Yes, we do have a draft in place that we can discuss. Okay. Thanks for the reminder. Okay. Um, we'll go to our city planner uh, engineer just through a quick anything, John or John. I had no further comments. Just great. Uh, the only comment I have is that um, there's required three parking spaces here, and it has to be five feet from the side and rear property lines. And so I'd prefer if you instead of showing cars show a nine by 18 space yep. and make sure that it's five feet from those two property boundaries. Okay, yeah, I'll show there's you There's room that. for it, it's just the way you pr presented it. Right. It doesn't show that there's five foot. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll put the uh, dimension on there as well. But I don't have any problems with the so, I'm moving sorry, forward. John, are you referring to this here? Those three cars, yeah. There's room for nine by 18 parking spaces that are still five feet from the rear and side property lines so they, they would need they would need to be five feet from this side yes and and so five feet from beacon street okay so so that you okay yeah I'll, I'll show the rectangles and i'll show the uh, dimension lines yeah you can leave the cars if you want yeah. <laughs> the proper size the proper size <laughs> yeah at least you moved away from the, Vol the Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> Nobody knows what that is anymore. That was smaller than a Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was a bike in the Beetle. Yeah. There's a clown car in the Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> hey, stranger things. Uh, okay, anyone else on the board? Thoughts, comments, questions? No, I, I didn't have any comments on the resolution. Uh, we're not there yet, but that's no. good to know. Hold on to that. No, no I think, no. Great. We'll go to the public. Anyone here on this application? Give it the requisite few seconds so in case somebody pops in from the bathroom. I'll accept a motion to close the public hearing. Motion. Motion by Lynn. Second. Second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then, um, as mentioned by the applicant, we do have a draft um, resolution to adopt in place. Uh, any discussion, thoughts, questions for Eric on the subject? Or motion to adopt? Motion. Motion by Karen. Seconded. Second by Lynn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda for. Oh! You're good. Yes, two minute break. Next item on the agenda. There has to be more proactive. Okay, next item on the agenda. We're uh, continuing our review of an application for site plan approval, indoor and outdoor event space, Hannah Lane. Good evening. Good evening. So, um, Again, we submitted revised plans based on the comments we received last month. Um, and again, I, there's some, I believe, relatively minor revisions to make based on the recent comments we received. Um, I'll, I'll review that paved versus grass area that John Russo um, commented on. And w we, I also believe that there's a um, resolution that was authorized to be reviewed for this one. There is. 
and you know, so any, any of these last things we can make subject to uh, taking care of those. Yeah, so there's a couple things that you know we, we know you do need to address. Yeah. So let's just kind of talk through some of those just to make sure we're all clear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, since he mentioned Mr. Russo. <laughs> You're up. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Ari. So on sheet 105, they have red hatching shown around what's going to be the storage trailer running through that area um, and then running towards Hannah Lane, which is grass and a tree presently. So are you actually paving through that area, removing that, or? Yeah. The goal there, given that there will be the, the Given that they will be digging off of the manhole there, the plan was to refill that, backfill that space with item four, but no, the goal is not to remove the tree or to remove a grassy area around the tree. I think that whether that becomes a circle or, you know, or whatever that becomes, you know, I do want to keep some of that landscaping there. Uh, I mean, the tree and that four foot wide stretch of grass there are on my property. You pointed out that that, that, that concrete pad adjacent is going away. That's not my property. Uh, I understand that, but I. Uh, uh, so no, that, I, I'm not minute, trying to get rid of the tree. The one first. I'm not trying to get rid of the tree. Okay, so then I would recommend remove the red hatching because, based upon the plans, that red hatching means you're putting in pavement or something else, according to the way it's called out. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll clarify that. Yeah, okay. The goal had been to retain permeability and to keep the tree there. Thank you. Um, with regards to the green hatching that is shown on the parking lot on the Talic site um, that's located on top of a large concrete pad, the city will be replacing the sewer line along a portion of Hannah Lane. As part of that deal, that concrete pad is being removed. I believe Mr. Clark has asked for additional landscaping. Um, I'm thinking that would be a good place to put it without striping that out and having an excessively large entrance way and providing a buffer for the two and a half more or the two and a half stalls that are present there instead of a vehicle turning around that tree and winding up head on with one of the other parked cars. So you're you're observing, John, that the that it may be better for the applicant to extend what looks to be in the dotted area green. Oh well, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a hatch, right? Yeah. So you got the dotted so green goes to the the green hatch stripe, right? And so instead of stopping what looks to be in, through the dotted green grass, oh, well, it's grass, it's trees. There's some brush in there. Yeah. So extending that to become a part of that green hatch, so which is currently is indicated away. as painted there, right? It's right. Just to extend a little bit of grass into that area. Ah, some resistance <laughs> through the mask. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I'm spending a, a lot of money on my neighbor's property, uh, and <coughs> and uh, you know, I'm going to screen it from the road, from from Route 52. I'm agreeing to screen the visibility of this parking lot from the public, and now we're worried about what it looks like in the area that you can't see. So we've screened it. And now we're worrying about the, the the landscaping in an area that we've just screened from public view. That's you know. Okay, we're just Wh talking here. We're working line? on recommendations. So I also understand, but you also have an excessively wide opening to that parking lot, do you not? I don't own that parking lot. I don't have an, I don't have an opening. I don't own that lot. So, so John, wouldn't wouldn't the striping the striping uh, would serve the purpose, but yep. With that concrete coming out, that area is being removed. There's a large concrete pad there. It's being removed. So, so who's, yes. who's who's then replacing it? Well, the city is going to replace where the concrete pad is being removed with the asphalt. Yeah. But the opportunity exists that if that's being removed. Landscaping can, can, can we, can we area. save yeah. the city some money and have the city put some uh, soil in there? Right. I mean, can the city not pave it and do what you're proposing? That sounds cheaper than doing what you're proposing. Fair question. 
I can talk with the city about doing that. We'll have to see what the agreement is with Mr. Piles. <laughs> and, if, and if Mr. Piles doesn't agree to it, how am I going to make him ah. agree to it? Good one. Um, We're just looking to see if the opportunity exists. <laughs> right. Look, I, I think if there's an opportunity through what the city's doing to have Mr. Piles? Yeah. Agree to. He's the what? The president of the. He's, he's the yes. He's the president of the Talix Board. Well, there's, a, there's a whole condominium association over there. Okay. He's, he's the owner of the property. I mean, he speaks for the owners of the property. Oh, that matters to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it, it, would, it would. I think it should maybe start to your point with a conversation between the city and Mr. Piles. We can do that. And look, if it ends up that he doesn't agree, then you're, you're, you have some asphalt there that you, you blank canvas to put some stripes on. Fair? I have already agreed to stripe as needed wherever. So that's okay. Fine. All right, great. Um, anything else? No. Okay. Mr. Clark. Uh, we've been asking for a long time, and the applicant has agreed in principle to propose landscaping on the northern end of the property, the parking lot, so that the view from 52 would not look at this large parking lot. Yeah. And they've agreed in principle to do it, but I want to see it on the site plan. Uh, normally we... Yeah, we, we, we agree to do that. We, we, we um, have a landscape person looking at that, and we'll, we'll have the specs and the planting schedule. That, that'll, that'll be on the uh, right. drawing. And uh, at the last meeting, the board requested a, uh, an enclosure around the dumpster that's going to be used for um, event refuse. Yeah, we'll add that. Okay. So just to. Those are my last two points. Just as far as the planting, we're talking about potentially adopting. And you're talking about then simultaneously before I sign off sharing with us a planting plan yeah what is what does that planting plan consist of as far as your understanding right now because I don't, oh. I don't want it to show up okay yeah. where you know we've got yeah. a little Charlie Brown Christmas tree no no it, it, if, if you if you see the um, where it says main site entrance yeah over, over on the north side there and and the, the, there, there's an existing tree but we're, we're, we're gonna plant um, I think it's four evergreen trees in that area. It depends how. It was hollies. Ho yeah. Hollies. Hollies. It was to create, it was hollies on six foot centers with what Brian Quinn had spent. Yeah. We worked with One Nature. Uh huh. And Brian Quinn spent um, hollies on six foot centers along that fence line uh, uh -huh. for, the, for that parking lot property. What size and what kind? Yeah, that, that, that'll be the, the detail will show up on the. On, on the planting plan, but but he, he understands what the issue was and he sized them appropriately. The goal okay. is to go in a hedgerow. Yeah. I mean, it, you know. Okay. Hollies don't grow fast. Anyway, they grow nice. I just I planted one and I'm like, what yeah. is going on here? It's been years. <laughs> have to water yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Anything else, John? John Russo. So I believe. Jennifer Gray had concerns with the agreement that yeah. was submitted. I, I, I was going to mention that. Um, and I'm sure she shared her observations with, I think, yourself. Yes. 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 I, on July 21st, I was forwarded, Ms. Caputo forwarded me an email from Ms. Gray's office telling me that we were good to move forward with the agreement. As, you know, and then Sunday night was told that it wasn't good to move forward. So it's. Uh, we could have been working on this for the last couple of weeks, and instead we're scrambling now while Ms. Gray is out of town. So we're doing our best to well, rectify We have that. representation Excuse by me. the same office. By well, the, the bottom line is, I don't you know, look. I don't. I wasn't privy to your discussions with Ms. Gray. I, I understand. You know, I don't know if she, the, when those agreements were submitted. I don't believe, and based on my discussions with Ms. Gray, she signed off on them and said they were okay. But that's I, a difference. We can. We can, we can agree to disagree. The bottom line is we need something more permanent, either an easement agreement mm. or a license or some type of irrevocable license agreement that I believe makes these parking spots. I believe you're misrepresenting my position. But I, I agree with you, and we're working on that. Okay, that's great. I Thank you. It. Thank you. Um, so, yes, those need to be a part of the final. Um, 
So with that, does our draft reflect, well, it obviously reflects satisfaction of engineering planning, but does it also reflect? Um, well, the question is, if you approve now and the, the enclosure and the landscaping plans are submitted and they're not to satisfaction, you know, who makes that final, who, who's making that decision and, and you know, sort of taking it out of the board's hands? Then. Yeah, well, that was my, uh, my that's, question, that's question about the so. landscaping. Oh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that we would submit for the final review and, and it would go back to John and John. Yeah, I mean, before, ultimately, before. <clears throat> ultimately, I won't be able to sign it until everything right. is in place and to the satisfaction yeah. of the city. It does kind of take it out of the review of the board, but um, do, you have, do you have one final review on this? Before? Yeah, they, they yeah. always send it to us for final review uh, to make sure everything is. Yeah. And, and, the, and the signed version is yeah. covering all the the basics and is correct. Right. Never, have, never interrupt, Mr. Clark. Mm -hmm. If we have comments, we forward them back, and they continue yep. to go through the revisions right. until it's. But it does, you know, if you have preferences about the, yep. the planting plan or something. So I was going to, I was going to ask the board, yeah. comfortable with that process, or do you want to, you want to have them come back for our further review? So let's discuss. Yeah, I mean, just to let you know, if it's those two points, yeah, I mean, the landscaping is as we described, and, and it, it'll be reflected on the drawing, and, and the enclosure will be there, and, and it'll match the um, that horizontal fence detail that we have everywhere else. So, so that, that, that's the intent. So, in, in terms of your review before the fact. So, are you okay with hallway hedge? It depends on what size and what kind, because you know some. What happens when you get a landscape plan? Yeah. <laughs> the specification, the specification that I discussed with Brian at One Nature was to create something that would need to be trimmed into a six foot tall, six foot ish tall hedgerow along the six foot tall fence there. Uh, so that would, you know, and he said that with that spacing, with the six seventy two inch planting, that within three to five years it would flush out into a full hedgerow. That was, that was his input, and uh, yeah, he knows much more about plants than I do. So it sounds like a steeds or something, so, I mean. A who? A what? A steeds holly would, would accomplish that. You're okay with it? I'm okay with it. Uh, so on the inside the, of the fence, there was, right? On the inside of the fence, that's correct. And there, were, there was a Latin name involved. I don't know if it was the steeds or not, I'm sorry. My Latin is behind. Anything else? Any thoughts? Uh, I had a question about the resolution. Are we that? Are we there yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what we're talking um, about. Yeah. So the resolution doesn't specify a maximum uh, event participant size. There's a there's a reference to the 100 person limit on the use of the building, and there is a comment that. You know, the building and the outdoor space will only be used for, you know, um, that's the word I'm looking for, you know, for the same event. It would be two separate events in each of the, you know, simultaneously. But um, I was curious about whether we wanted to see specification of a, of a maximum attender, you know, or event goer. When you say the resolution doesn't, you mean the actual resolution document itself or yeah. the resolution as it encompasses the application material? The resolution document makes some... Yeah, the resolution states occupancy for indoor event space shall be limited to 100 people, but it doesn't reference it at a maximum or for outdoor events. So. So, I see. Yeah. And so I'm, you know, I've been thinking about these different uh, applications with event spaces in, in terms of a parity and consistency approach and We've been getting a ton of questions on other event uses, proposed event uses, about what's your maximum attendance and how is that tied into your parking capacity and how will you administratively control that? Is it going to be through ticket sales? Is it going to be through you know, head counting? And there's a couple of different, I think even at, 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 uh, at the yard, there's a couple of different event types in that there could be a a concert or a DJ set that might be the sort of thing that you could, you know, you could ticket, you get a populace, they arrive and they're there for the whole event, but then there's also things like maybe the Halloween event where people may be flowing in and out of it over a longer period. So this kind of stuff is flowing through my head and like I said, from a perspective of 
So wanting the planning board to be consistent for everybody's similar applications. Do you have do you have an ability to um, place and state a, not, a, a maximum for outdoor events, a maximum capacity? Well, what we have at, throughout our I mean, throughout our narrative and application, what we have said is 150 for outdoor events, unless we rented. Part of our agreement with Talix is the ability to uh, rent additional parking and outdoor space um, to you know for for one-off events. And, uh, and so, you know, for something like, for example, the Pride event that we hosted this past year, we would be interested in make going bigger next year. It was a successful event. There was, you know, nice, good attendance. And, I, and it was the first time it had happened, and we expected it would grow. And so in our ideal, we would have 150-person limit for our standard events. But every once in a while, if we were to rent additional space, adjacent to our property, that we would be able to host more people than that for the kind of community events that warrant that. And so we're, you know, ongoing rights require ongoing responsibilities. I don't have an issue with our attendance being tethered to our parking. Um, that's, you know, and us enforcing that in an ongoing way, that's not an issue for us. But, uh, you know, I, I would hate to think that you know, any capacity to rent additional space and have a bigger thing that engaged the community in a greater way was precluded by the terms of the agreement. Um, I, you know, as I said, I have no... Well, look, look yeah, that makes sense. Well, also, does that, do we then need, like, a permit, yeah, though, when that happens? Like, yeah, because... Uh, it opens up sort of a new, new parameters if it's going to be, if we're limiting it to 150, but allowing then larger events over 150, does the applicant then have to submit proof that it has, you know, validated the additional parking and the additional space, how is that done? That's a new procedure that's being brought up. I, I, you know, I mean, if that's hasn't a, been discussed previously. If that's a process that exists with the building department, I mean, our existing, and, you know, in advance right of this process right now, right now, we basis. go to the building department and the police department for every one of our events. We have to, no problems with a large, you know, saying in the future if we, that yeah, that, that, when you want to expand. That's fine. Do those, do, do you, do you, do you state when you do that? to the city an intended maximum? Or is there some limiting element to? I mean, as of now, uh, yes, there are, there are, I mean, our current permits, you know, if we're filling out a tent permit, then that, that says how many people are gonna be under the tent. If we're doing a noise permit, it's, a, it's parameters, you know, there occupancy you hours, so on and so forth. So, so, so I'm, I'm comfortable with what the resolution here states as far as the this, this sort of average, but then also comfortable with the one-off measures and controls and process in place for those types of events. So therefore, at least from what I hear, there is a process in place for both. One has controls here listed and the other is a per event where those controls are managed through the single uh, permit process, right? So are you, are you, but if you want to set a maximum outdoor limit at 150, and then if it's over that, they're going to have to follow some other procedure to go over that. Well, it sounds like that's what you do anyway. So right. I'm it, happy. It is, and I have no problem with that being part of yeah, the letter. I'm happy memorializing that. Yep. So if, if the board's if the board's acceptable, but we'll have to come up with some, you know, we'll have to. I'm just trying to uh, get a get an understanding of what that language should be exactly. So. Hmm. Adopt the resolution tonight. Yeah, it would, it would be something akin to um, in events or in whatever situations um, where applicant is seeking a larger or something Greater to that effect, larger event than 150. Um, the understanding is is that it was it would be that would be managed through the individual per event permit process. Do you, would you still, for outdoor events, would you still have to get permits from this, separate permits from the city for an event under 150? That's no, because that would be set up by this whole that would be permitted use. This process. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if it's over 150, then they would have to obtain the necessary permits from the city to go over 150. No and, problem. And approve, you know, and submit proof of additional parking and additional space. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would be it. So, so this is just the administrative process. That, that process that is well. And if this is something that happens twice a year, yeah. we're, we're stretching, <laughs> you know? I mean, this, right. is, this isn't something that I'm, 
you know, I'm not going to get into an intermittent versus occasional here. I, uh, yeah. and, I, and I don't have a parking consultant to tell me that if I add hotel rooms, I need less parking spaces. So, yeah. so, so forgive me, but th everybody's this operating under different constraints, right? This no, carries no. this carries with the property regardless of owner, right? Um, yes, once site plan approval is so once the once the special permit approval is granted, I believe it does carry. You know, for that carry. reason alone, you do well at it, right? You know what you're doing. You know the process for how to get to the city for single-use permits, blah, blah, blah. My, my point in wanting to make sure that that part is memorialized here is for should it carry to sure. a, another future owner. Yes. So, okay, are we good with the language then? Yeah, I think we, so what I have is when the, we'll allow events, so we'll have for occupant, or indoor events or outdoor event space shall be limited to 150 people. The event, an event is over 150, an applicant is required to obtain appropriate permits from the city and submit proof of additional parking and, I, I was going to say space for the event, but I don't know if there's a different word you want to use than space or additional uh, requirements. Area. Capacity? Is capacity more generic? Or? Adequate space for this, you know, for this, for the event planned. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't get you know, I love this use. iterative creative process. And, and just to be clear, the 150, that's, that's the total total participation of, of, of that 150, 100 can go into the building at any one time, but the total is 150. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Probably 95 because staff, you know. Right. No one can ever blame us for not being granular. <laughs> A little bit OCD, pay really close. My, my background is off-Broadway theater. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I've been audited by like all the fire marshals. I've been inspected by all the people. You know, this is fine. Yeah, I'm, great. Give me a hoop. I'll jump. Thank you. So um, I will accept a motion to adopt with the language as amended, as just discussed. Does the, hold on, does the resolution include an updated agreement? It includes the requirement of the submission of an updated agreement. So that that is a condition. Condition of the resolutions, they did submit the appropriate uh, the agreement that you know would be acceptable to my office. Understood. I apologize if there was confusion or misunderstandings previous. Appreciate it. Fair. Okay. We have. Do we have a motion on the table? Motion. Motion by Karen. Second. Second by Len. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And thank you. Best of luck. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move to um, our next item on the agenda. This is uh, 146 Verplank Avenue. And um, this is a continued review of, our, uh, of an application for subdivision approval to lot residential. Hi. Good evening. I'm Dan Welcome. Kohler with Hudson Land Design. I've had a chance to review the draft resolution that was presented and we have no objections to it as it's written and if the board wishes to uh, go ahead and grant that uh, final approval tonight, we'd be appreciated. Yeah, I, I think, um, at least as far as my understanding, we have everything in place. Um, engineer, planner, clear? Yes. Clear. Yeah, and so any other questions or comments or Observations by board. Otherwise, I'll accept a motion to adopt. Motion. Motion by Karen. Seconded. Second by Lynn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. You, my friend, <laughs> win. Uh, win. <laughs> 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 Literally, I thought we I thought we had one last month, but you're number one. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is 67 Grove. Uh, and this is a continued review of an application for subdivision approval to lot residential. Let's see if we can get you in and out quicker. I should have him fill in for me for once. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. You both are the... He's never just here. Just send one person. He's never here. Anyway, it's just <laughs> like Aria. He just stands up. He just yeah. pops up and down. Anyway, uh, how are you? Doing well. Good. Uh, for the record, Mr. Chairman, Mike Bodner, Hudson Land Design, uh, for the applicant. And as Dan said, you also have a draft resolution uh, for your consideration tonight, and we're just looking forward to uh, having you vote on that. Great. Um, planner, engineer, thoughts, comments? I have no comments. Good. No comments. Board. 
Great. I'll accept a motion to adopt. Motion. Second. Motion by Len, second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Great. Have a good evening. Uh, let's see. Next item on the agenda. This we're is. We are. We're cooking with, <laughs> cooking with gasoline. Uh, where are we? We're at um, two, 4 2 eight. Cross Street. Yes. Uh, evening. This is uh, our continued review of an application for site plan approval and subdivision approval to Cross Street. Sorry, give me a moment to uh, set up. Sure. Remind me, is it just a matter of connecting this dog? Oh my gosh, you're asking the wrong person. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Chair, while they're getting ready, just as a preliminary matter, there's a question that had come up whether um, oh, subdivision, uh, I believe that whether uh, subdivision uh, is merger. Uh, this is a whole bunch of questions. Is that? Yeah. 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 Right, and because it's not on a filed subdivision plat, it was determined that it, that subdivision approval is not okay. required for this application. Yeah. So that issue has been resolved. Great. Thank you. One administrative item out of the way. Come on, there we go. It's a little sleepy. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Apparently. So I think what we can also do is, well, let's wait for the applicant. I think John would approve of any uh, anthropomorphic uh, cryptid. No <laughs> cryptids. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Good to go? Good. Yes. Go. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. How old is she? You need to bring that to the whole population. Oh, that was when she was three. And now she's 13. Wow. <laughs> Goes by insanely uh -huh. fast. Yeah. Like we were just talking about it tonight. I'm doing college tours now. Yeah, my daughter's got the other one. 22 this fall. That oh. like was about five seconds ago. Yeah. I'm sending my second one to college next week. Mm. Me too, by the way. Are you? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, yay for us. Oh, Although, <laughs> I still have a three year old. Oh, jeez, that's right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Good evening, Dan Kohler again, Hudson Land Design for the record. Um, the parcel is located at the northeast corner of Cross and Main, that's the main development area. Uh, we have a little over 24,000 square feet of floor area proposed on three stories where the first floor will be retail with some common area. Uh, the upper floors will consist of nine affordable senior and nine market rate uh, rental units. And the building will have a green roof and there will be a public plaza over in the, actually in the southwest corner, um, which is right at the intersection that I just mentioned across in Maine. Uh, the project includes off-site parking. That's a, the 152 Main Street parcel. Um, Stormwater management improvements associated with the improvements over at the 152 and also at the 2 Cross Street. Uh, new waters, new sanitary sewer services, and uh, lighting and landscaping improvements. So uh, that's the general of that. Uh, I can show anybody anything on the screen here, but I think I'm going to turn it over and and have them talk a little bit about the building, which is much better presentation than mine. <laughs> <laughs> Without your support, it wouldn't, wouldn't be there. Again, for the record, my name is uh, Austin Harris, and I'm with Joe Tarhan. Um, uh, we put together a little uh, slide presentation just to uh, highlight some of the changes that we made recently. <coughs> we uh, recently had several meetings with the uh, 
Architectural Review Board uh, last spring uh, and just wanted to highlight some of the changes that we had made since the Architectural Review Board uh, in last spring. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is on, on sheet A6, uh, we added notes about the stair bulkhead and uh, the greenhouse uh, adjustment. Also on A6, uh, we have called out the, the different materials and the colors. Uh, and, oops, sorry. And so that was included in the package that was uh, shared with the, with the board. And I, we hope it addressed some of the concerns like, or questions you had about the materiality. <coughs> the other thing that we changed was, or updated was on page uh, seven. Um, we uh, showed uh, in-ground planting at, at the plaza. Uh, and um, we changed the uh, planting bed uh, across, uh, along Cross Street. Uh, the, the windows, we added some windows on that uh, re-entered corner, um, and also we updated the brick pattern and uh, the mullions at the, the bay windows, and uh, we showed the fully operable uh, storefront at the plaza. And so it's just sort of, this is an image of um, some of the updates um, <coughs> at the corner. And there's just an enlarged uh, image of that uh, plaza area with some seating. Uh, and uh, around the tree will be permeable pavers. Uh, and just a little bit more information about the uh, plaza. Um, we, we envision this plaza to have uh, flexible seating. Uh, the the plaza is around 285, 284 uh, square feet. Uh, and we're thinking that you know, the number of occupants will be somewhere around 15 to 20. Uh, but it would be definitely open to the public uh, for public access and also working with um, whoever the retailer is at that uh, area. But primarily this will be a, a, a public plaza. Uh, the bricks that we're using are, are a running barn pattern, the same type of bricks that are used on the, uh, the, the street, uh, the, side, the public sidewalk. And the idea there is to, to make it seem as if it's a public uh, uh, realm and that is part of the public uh, 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 environs. <coughs> the other change was uh, we provided some updated images for the, on the north uh, facade uh, of the building, and we wanted just to highlight some of the uh, the property, the fence that we have along the, the property uh, of the adjacent uh, residential um, neighbor. So uh, here's looking down, looking uh, south uh, uh, from Cross Street, uh, showing the the north elevation and the uh, the, the fence. So those are some of the, the highlights that we've done uh, so far. Uh, we also have um, some materials that we brought along as samples for, uh, for uh, consideration. Um, so we can, we can go through that or we can address any questions you, the, the board may have. Um, I know it's a late evening. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's always, it's always good to, well, we want to do, definitely put top of tails on the architectural review. I'm sorry. I, I oh, geez, I'm not, I'm not following my own no advice. Worries. We, we want to, you know, finalize and also hear back from the um, review board members just on where you've landed um, and also review the material. But let's, let's hold that over till you know, we hear from our consultants on some of the other potential um, items to be addressed. I know landscaping was one of them. John, right, the landscape area. Um, and then hear from our consultant, and then let's talk about architectural review. Okay. Um, yeah, that, the, the, I think the main problem I had was that uh, there's a requirement for a 10% landscaped area in this district, and you're listed as 5.8%, so I asked for next time you would have uh, the areas that you count as landscaping and figure out how you can get additional uh, green space area. In the, on other applications, we have counted the plaza area if it has significant landscape elements in it. You know, a single tree maybe not, is not enough to make that happen, but, uh, so you have to come up with 10% or ask for variance. And I think the easier way to do that would be to, to provide some landscape planters in the in the plaza area so that it has a significant enough green space feel to it, uh, perimeter to it, so that you can count that. And also, 
it seems to me that driveway in the back is wider than it needs to be in some cases in some areas so that you can add to that landscape strip in the back maybe that's how you can come up with your 10 percent thanks john um the other I issues um some of the um in the lighting plan some of the fixtures don't match the requirements in the code for the color rendering index and the uh, full cutoff fixtures. Um, just make sure that the, the fixtures um, match the requirements in, in the lighting section of the code. Um, I'm, I'm asking for a larger detail of the uh, corner plaza. That view um, is nice, but a site plan blow up of that area so we can see where the what the paver patterns look like and all that sort of thing a little better um, and that's that's the major points great any any yeah I mean, I, you know obviously we took over part of the plan set so that we didn't have to have as much back and forth between us so um, I know that there was some calculations that were previously presented to the board where it was 10.3 percent and I believe that included the the plaza well so um, probably a mistake by on my part for I, I only ended up counting up certain parts so um, they they corrected me on that on how that was uh, calculated before so the next revision will have that different calculation on it okay um, and, and we, we can consider uh, that rear drive we'll take a look at that as well yeah just in case John, can I ask how you reach the threshold to, um, because we're providing public access, so we can get down to 5%? Is there a... Uh, yeah, the way the code reads is, as I interpret the way the code reads, is that you can go to 5% landscaped area if the landscaped area is accessible to the public. So that would mean that the plaza has to be 5% of your, of your coverage to qualify for that. So it has to be a much more significant uh, public plaza in order to cut that down. You know, you can't count the land back in the corner um, um, unless you meet the full 10%. That's the way I read it anyway. Right. It says, uh, this requirement shall be reduced to 5% if the landscaped area is accessible to the public. So that implies the 5% has to be you know, consistent with a plaza or some public park or something. Not, and I don't think that plaza is going to make five percent of your of your no, no, land area. No. Um, and with regard to light fixtures, we've actually sent it out to a lighting manufacturer. We've told them okay. all the parameters, and so we'll we'll have something for the next submittal on that. And the scale uh, of these site plans is awful small. Yeah. So. Yeah, the overall showing it between the, you know, I like the fact that you see the whole picture. Oh, yeah, you the need a whole picture, but you other, also need a larger but, yeah, we site can, plan we can of the possibly. of the building area itself because yeah. it's pretty hard to read at that scale. Okay. So sure. next time, I would advise you to do a bigger scale of the main site and the, uh, a larger scale, even more so for the plaza itself. And if you're going to use it to calculate part of your green space uh, coverage, I think you're going to have to have some sort of perimeter planters or enough planters that, that it comes off as a, a green space rather than a strict hard space. If that's if I'm reading it right from the board, how we've done it in the past at yeah. like 416 Main. And, yeah, it's consistent. Uh, and just citizens a, bank just, property just to tease that out a little bit the, and, and just to figure out how to uh, arrange the planters I think that one of the challenges that we've been having is making this feel as a, a public plaza right and, and not like border it off with you know planters along the edge and and making the public feel as if they're welcomed in the space and sometimes when you put those planters up it's sort of does you know disinvites people from uh, yeah. using the space? So it's kind of the, the, the challenge that we're having with uh, you know providing planters in there, but also making it sort of a public amenity. Amend well, if if you don't if you have enough green space on the property, you don't need to count the plaza. Then you can 
make it as hard as you like. Uh, but if you need it to calculate that 10%, then it has to have enough of a green space element that we can call it a landscaped area. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be on the perimeter. It, has to, it could be along the building walls. It could be, you know, surrounding the tree, tree well. It right. could, you know, um, it just can't be completely hard and, and have it classified as part of the landscaped area. And it wouldn't necessarily need to be a raised planter. Well, no, but, but the other challenge is, you know, where it becomes low grass, it becomes a shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've seen it a lot in co college campuses where, you know, they cut corners and that becomes a new pathway. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a delicate challenge. We understand, you know, uh, we understand your parameters and what you're requiring, requiring from us. So it's us to, up to us to sort of design something yeah. that's appropriate. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Russo. So with regards to the retaining walls that are being constructed on 152 Main, they abut right up to the city's parking lot on Cross Street. So we're asking for more information on the walls, and the biggest question is insulation of those walls. Is it going to require easements from the city, some license agreement from the city? How are they being installed without going on to the city's property? Uh, with regards to stormwater, they've done some initial soil testing out there. They're looking at doing infiltration systems on the site. Um, some additional work has to be done, uh, but I do have a concern with the overflow from the one basin on the south side of 152. It's the emergency overflow is conveying water towards the roadway, um, and we just have water running down West Church. I'd like to see the drainage extended up West Church and tied in uh, for your overflow. Um, and then we have a number of cleanup and comments with regards to utilities. Great, thanks. I got two questions. I'm looking at this rendering. I'm just curious. I see people in greenery on the roof. Is that is that part of your plan? So. So um, as, as stated before, we were going to have a green roof, but also it's going to be a roof that the uh, residents can, can, occupy, can uh, use. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and of course, it has a, 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 a greenhouse on it, so people will have access. The residents of the building will have access to the, uh, to the roof. Does the green roof count towards the 10%? No. I, I, we have never used it that way. It doesn't specifically say one way or the other in the code, but. Um, since it's not, you know, public access. Well, it doesn't have to be public access, but it has to be at least publicly viewable. I, I, yeah, that, that's I kind of right, yeah. Three stories down. Publicly yeah. appreciated. I don't know. That's, yeah. No, I get it. Um, but so that's with your part of your day one plan. Co the, the, the roof. Uh, yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Something like two thirds of the roof is. Yeah is a green roof and they also have a greenhouse up there which is a nice feature yeah that is nice i think i've seen so many applications where they zhuzh the renderings with green roof and all kinds of nice stuff <laughs> right. and then it never gets built i'm, yeah, I'm also curious too i'm sure you I, just my own curiosity i'm sure you created this rendering with a software that gives you the actual time of day is this what time of day is this uh boy that's a tough one um <laughs> Let me just take a look at the shadows. Well, I, and I, I ask because I, I just wonder if the, the quality of light at that corner, which as you render it, is quite delightful, if that's real, it's got to be morning. Or for the shadow to be uh, I just, southwest. Yeah, that's morning. Which, which image are you looking at? Are you looking at this? Yeah, that's southwest corner. Is looking at. Right. So the shadow is being cast to the west, right. which means the sun's coming up over the mountains. Or so is this like 8 in the morning? Uh, uh, your window. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the afternoon. that's the in question. The afternoon, like, <laughs> yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, right. your, your office is right down there. Yeah. We took there uh, creative license. <laughs> it's cre okay, well that answers my question. It is creative license. Yes. So this will never, act, this corner will never actually look like that. Well, um, you will get. You don't have to uh, answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ask for my own purposes. Right. Because renderings are there obviously to serve a purpose and you've served it well but those of us who know that yep. you can take creative license 
are abundantly curious. Okay, um, so architectural review. Um, do, do you want to give just a quick report out in terms of yeah, sure. where John we're at? Probably help me you sure. Check the minutes if I miss stuff, but I know that some of the some of the main topics. The mic, please. Oh, sorry. Some of the main topics that we discussed. Uh, I think the the board had an overall very positive reaction to the details and the articulation in the roof. But I remember there was a question about how to deal with potential bird nesting and whether that would cause any damage to the brick face if it was allowed to happen. So we were asking about what kind of measures could be taken to prevent that without the nasty looking, you know, tacky strip, you know, the, the pin cushion effect. Right. We're, and we're still looking at that. I mean, we included a couple of uh, sketches here of some of the ideas we're thinking about for the, uh, you know, how to control uh, uh, bird nesting. So one of the things we'll do is really is slope the top of that cornice line. But the other thing uh, is, I think what we're more concerned about is what happens above the bay windows. Um, and again, it's just, we'll just have to put, um, for now we're thinking it's just gonna have to be the bird control uh, wires that we, we put over there. Okay. But certainly we, we were all in favor of the dramatic effects and the shadows created by these features, so we didn't want to right. lose them, but we right. just wanted to try to protect the facade from mm -hmm. damage from, uh, yeah, so anyhow, uh, so, so one of the other things we, we talked about um, potential, I think we had, we had a discussion about changes in the brick material because some of the original material shown was a, turned out to be an imported, insanely expensive, right. the I long thing, so, but you so guys have stuff to show So us, we right? brought s yeah. some samples of that uh, to, to, to discuss with the team and, and samples of uh, other material that we're thinking about using on the, uh, the building. Yeah, I believe we've reached that interval. One of the, one of the other, yeah, maybe, so maybe we're there almost there on that, but one of the other topics we had was about the area, that, the facade over the plaza. And I think there's been discussions over the history of the project about could be green wall, could be curated art, or it could be this decorative brick. And I was wondering if there's been any more, you know, of a, of a movement in any particular direction. Yeah, I hate to go back to this image. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we've, we've, we've Sorry, talked about, it for you. <laughs> one of the things so that we talked about yeah, was, I think, uh, I think we're, we're strongly, uh, along with the development team, we're strongly thinking about art uh, to, to go on that wall. It could be a revolving art installation. I think the, the, the one of the concerns was, you know, what happens when you don't have the art? And then we thought that this brick pattern that we have will create some very interesting shadows of, uh, on that wall. Uh, and so, and, and then, you know, we introduce uh, windows uh, on that wall also, kind of, kind of breaks down that, that, that big facade. And those windows are actually kitchen windows, so it's like sort of a nice view out uh, at, your, at your, your kitchen. So I think the, I, right. the idea here is, is to have something that, if, you, if you're not uh, displaying art, it's something that's sort of tactile and, and has some... Uh, so, so then, let me understand, you would, you would maintain that brick texture? Yes while also entertaining the ability to apply art to that right. and, facade. Okay. And one of the things, I mean, we haven't gotten to the details, but I think one of, one of the things we're thinking is about, you know, um, having, um, uh, I'm losing the thought for the word, I'm going to say pins uh, or... Um, anchors? Anchors. No, yeah. Well, you know, maybe T-shaped anchors where you can uh, put uh, guide wires around and, uh, so that, you know, they're not very noticeable when you don't have art there take the guide right. wires out and so the anchor state remain there. But then when you have artwork there, you, you, you put your guide wires up and then you can, you can apply the art on that wall. Yeah, I mean, Beacon has a history of, and there's a particular artist still around, um, applying rather large, beautiful murals, actually. I'm taking a Rick Price. Oh, Rick Price is awesome. Oh, right. Yeah, I, I mean, John Clark was we were just talking about it today. You know, like, like, there's a the art piece by uh, <laughs> um, Price. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, the river. No, right, right. The, or the, the electric windows. Right. Yeah. So, so right. there, you know, and it's it's in a prominent location, and you know there yeah. is that tradition at that corner to, yeah. to display art. So I think, uh, you know, although we we hope, it, you know, it's not a condition of the site plan approval, but I think it's something that we really want to. Uh, include in sort of the spirit of, uh, of that corner. Yeah, I, I wouldn't make it a condition only because I think the spirit of what happens in Beacon because it's such an artistic community is that it happens organically mm -hmm. and building owners mm -hmm. are, you know, very much on board with that organic 
display of art. So, so I, I wouldn't want to codify that. Right. right. Yeah, but you, you might want to codify that the the art is permitted as in this area. Yep. So that they don't have to come in for a special permit for each time. Ah, that's put a up good a mural. point. Is it is it not otherwise mm -hmm. permitted? We have to do a. I think they have to clear. I mean, we have to do a review for the gallery space down the you know adjacent to the Howland Center for them to, to hang that yeah. mural panel. So if we don't want to have them have to come back, we can not require it, but but permit it, right? Right. Yeah, permit good, it as an option well, on that wall. That's a great call out. I think if you guys are amenable, I think that's something we'd like to memorialize. Just from an operational standpoint, looking at it from the owner's perspective, we would love to have a, uh, a process in place that allowed us to do something such as no permit at all or a simple building permit uh, that didn't require discretionary yeah. approval and long evening meetings right. to put some on. Yeah, you don't want to come look at us for yeah. hours on end again. Yeah, especially if it's creative, right? I mean, because the committees have a, a horrible effect on uh, creative uh, ideas, as much as I love our committee. So, so question, question for the board here tonight on the, on the, the decorative brick. Does, any, does anyone, would anyone recommend that a different pattern be considered some, other than something that is such a regular matrix, either like random dropouts in certain positions or just a different um, uh, pattern with the, with the pattern brick that, that is, it's a very regular. I mean, it, you know, it's like we were looking at a lot of the uh, finish, finish, finish bond um, brick patterns and you know, you can go over the top with them or you can sort of just let the shadows play with it. Um, so we, we, you know, we were half, you know, half a dozen, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, do we go for something or do we just sort of keep it simple and um, um, have this, this sort of this backdrop? You know, there's a risk of monotony. I mean, we're not opposed to it. I, I don't know. It could, it, could take on, it could take on so many permutations, so you could spend the rest of your life trying to develop a pattern. Or you give it to a first year with. student, you tell them to come up with a pattern. Oh, Make sure to a first year student. Yeah. Tell Write me an R script. Do, do Sorry, random dropouts in my matrix. Yeah, I, but I personally like the pattern. I like the texture. And I like the somewhat regimented nature of it because it, it, it comports with the just sort of what I would consider, I don't know, lack of a better word, just the um, organization of the of the remaining you know elements. It, it just it works. For the the party, as they used to say, the, the Beaux Arts. The, the party. Of Le Corbusier. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I like the regular pattern. Too. Yeah. I like the regular pattern because it's it's sort of asking for uh, something, and it and it doesn't look like there, it's an abs. There's an absence if there's nothing there. Wow. That's so that's deep. <laughs> Does that make sense? Ooh, so no. Well, well, but also, if you decide to not, it doesn't look like you've uh, uh, decided to abandon a good idea. It's just, then it's just the pattern, right? right? But if you start utilizing it in some way, that whatever you want to do, right? Yeah. Or whatever uh, happens organically. I feel like I'm back um, and forth here. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> um, we're, we're jumping all over it. Yeah, I think, I think the majority <laughs> of us are in agreement that although I don't know where Kevin landed, but it sounded good, <laughs> that that pattern is just fine. And that I think we need to just return to the memorializing of yeah. the ease by which, I don't know how we, how, how we set the language, uh, art can be applied to the building without having to go through a rigmarole. Right. So is that, is that something we would uh, apply to the resolution? I'd, I'd want to check on the code okay. and, you know, see if there were specific requirements depending on what type of installation it is and, you know, uh, whether there are any specific code requirements for approvals. Yeah. We do have an approval requirement, I'm pretty sure, because we've gone through it for... So can you override that approval requirement by putting something in your resolution saying it's pre-allowed? I don't know right. what the answer to that is. Yeah. I've, I've been involved with situations where uh, what's the difference between signage and artwork, right? And there's also something about uh, lettering and other things, I think, that have to do with signage because of previous uh, 
uh, things that have happened. I think that you would, then there's Barbara Kruger, who's all her work is just text, right? So is that a sign? Is it art? And, and I think we need to somewhat be flexible about. Um, uh, in my view, there's a distinction, and you'll help us with this, Eric, between there you go. advertising right. and art. So the let's, intent, let's quickly right? look at materials. Yep. And then um, we can talk about scheduling a public hearing. So as far as materials, what do you have? Um, so um, as we talked about before, uh, when we went with the review, uh, the architectural review uh, board, we had sorry, we had looked at a uh, German uh, brick. It's a handcrafted brick uh, that was pretty uh, uh, pricey, uh, and we sort of switched gears and looked at uh, what's called the Flint Hill. It's by uh, Glen Gary, um, and actually the sample here is the same Flint Hill sample. Uh, <clears throat> and then this image mm -hmm. above, uh, you can barely see it, it's sort of the, you know, the, the bricks turned and creating that sort of uh, shadow using the same uh, Flint Hill uh, brick. And like, like I said, it's the same color as the one below. But and this, this is a brick face material, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's a full brick. Uh, dimensional. Well, oh, it is brick. dimensional brick? Yeah, right. Right. No. So, so these samples are just, you know, uh, they, they okay. do these boards for you. But it's a full depth. Uh, and and the, the units are, this, are, this yes. is representative. Right. right. It's like a Roman brick. Yes, it's called the uh, um, Roman Maxis from Glen Gary. You know, it's a real departure from what you typically see here in Bacon as a brick town. Right. Well, it's a you brick know, it's area. A brick town. There's like brick yards north and south. DPDW? D D P D w? No. D Jennings Point Brickwork, DPDW. Um, uh, it's getting late. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, no, it's it's a it's a serious departure from what you typically see on Main Street. So, so that's what we talked about with uh, the architectural review boards. <laughs> Do you think it's great in the middle of the historic district to have that sort of departure in terms of color? I'm not. I like the dimensions. But the color, I'm, I'm a little worried about. Especially with the glass factory across the Well, on the, one, on the one hand, and I'm, I don't know where I land on this, the glass factory is it's in and of itself unique, distinct. I don't know if those are DPBW. Um, but it, it, could, it could lend itself a nice contrast to that and, and put that building in relief, if you know what I mean. Act as a backdrop as opposed to trying to mimic. Also, there's, there is a uniformity. And one of the problems we've had in the new buildings in Main Street is that there's an incredible amount of uniformity and flatness and redness in the new buildings, in the uh, thin brick that's been put up and also in the dimensional brick. And that is not usual. That's not abnormal. And we've built so many of those buildings with a very uh, uh, banal brick that's even toned, there's no variation in it. Uh, before we were more, uh, I think, had more uh, uh, sophisticated designers. Uh, and I, I, to be honest. Make sure um, Ari is there. How, how, I, I thought, I <laughs> how do you achieve that texture on that pattern with this brick? Uh, which texture? The, the art wall. Above the plaza. Oh, the. Um, the protruding brick. Right, right. So they've done that uh, on. You know, they'll uh, split one of the smaller bricks, and they've done this image I was showing you previously uh, in the upper right hand corner. It's the same oh. thing with they've done uh, with the same uh, brick. Okay. I see. You're all good with it? You don't like it. Well, you don't this, is, this, is, this is probably one of the first buildings that we have looked at where it is, it, it's meeting the standards of the, the, of the historic district in terms of the proportions of the windows and the 
I mean, this, in some ways, this, some of the elements of this building look like the textbook illustration in one of the one of the master plans for a, you know, quote unquote modern interpretation of the of the of the relatively broad requirements that we have that are actually enforceable, right? Those, yeah, there's they're actually in the zoning code as design guideline illustrations. Yeah. And there's one which has projecting bay windows, squarish bay windows like this. Mm -hmm. I grabbed from some architect in San Francisco or something. Um, but yes, I'm not saying that it's incompatible. I'm just wondering about the color. Mm -hmm. um, because if you use the different proportions and you have the different window patterns, maybe having the similar color scheme uh, might. There is a provision in the code uh, for historic districts that says uh, compatibility does not imply historic reproduction but new architecture shall also not impose arbitrarily impose contrasting material scales colors or design features so the idea is compatible you don't want reproductions but you also don't want deliberate contrast yeah so to that point it, does the does the brick come in something a little bit more yeah, yeah so I, I mean, some of the other colors, um, uh, right, and, and, and actually, um, to be totally transparent, the conversations we've been having with uh, Glengarry is these bottom two are, uh, they're no longer running them from that plant, so they have a new run coming out of a, a, a plant that um, they would have updated uh, colors. But we felt as if this uh, flint was a, a interesting uh, uh, lighter color, um, not trying to mimic some of the, the the red that's on Main Street, but also, you know, designing the building in the spirit of the of the sort of historic uh, guidelines. How is it going to? How will it compare to the to the stone on the first floor? I'm sorry. Floor? How will the color compare to the facade on the on the on the ground floor? So oh. we, yeah. Yeah. we have um, material for. Uh, uh, this is a precast acid wash, so that would be. Uh, yeah, so maybe we need to look Can at we that. Have the brick too? Yeah, just yeah. unfortunately, because maybe the right the contrast between the two would, would be served better by having a more reddish brick. Yeah. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of opinions about this. I'm sure, there's uh, a contrast and uh, complementary. As you probably can tell us more about her, would have your own opinions. There's there's a more of a subtle range there, right? And the textures uh, compatible. If you if, if as as at the building, I mean the renderings so. appear that there's more contrast between, yeah. which I like. Um, although this is definitely quite a bit darker. Yeah, so that you doesn't matter. You know, the other one that that looks washed out to me. Yeah. But that's my opinion. That what the rendering looks washed out. Do they have samples available of the new ones yet? Not yet. Is that like the, it's it's they say it was about six months away. But I mean, we're I, 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 for approval process. No this one thing, but for for, for for need for need of material when right. construction happens, there would be an issue to to actually construct. But it's an issue now, and so they obviously they can't commit to. Uh, but I think they could the probably the day, approximate it with their existing samples, right? And it's going to be. You're sensing a little bit of discomfort, I think, in general, on that color. Right. And again, yeah. I think the brick shape, that doesn't do size, color. texture, all good. Right. Um, because it's not trying to replicate everything else that's on Main Street. But I think uh, I think a nod to the color right. would help balance right. things a little bit not matchy matchy but right that's what I was getting at you know I, I we don't want to I, I mean we're trying to do something special at this corner and yeah. and sort of uh, keying off some of the other buildings uh, along Main Street but we don't want to sort of match the, the reddish orange brick that's there yeah look I think I think you're going a long way in not matching the brick by the shape and the pattern so personally I feel like if we if we went 
more toward a red, stay away from orange, right. that it, it would help the, you know, compatibility, if you will. And one, one point that may be another in favor of that is that warm colors in that west end of Main Street at sunset and all those building facades get really painted by the sun, right. create a pretty dramatic effect. So you know, that may also be an argument for going with a, with a warmer color on the brick. Okay, I, we, we, we understand. I mean, not to sort of push at this anymore, um, but again, this, we, we just thought this was sort of a softer color, but we, we totally understand the, the comments. And yeah, I think it would, we'd appreciate if you could explore right. more along the red line, if, if that's and something you're willing to do. And for us, this, that's something that we can look into. I think it was more important, sort of the, the type of brick, the texture of the brick, the size of the brick, uh, was something that the board felt yeah, I think comfortable with. I think we're all on board on those other elements. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, um, I don't know if you want to go through some of the other material. Uh, so the, the storefronts will be this uh, white oak. Uh, Do you have that? Oh, man. Cool. Do you have the color of the cladding on the, uh, on the third uh, sure. story above the uh, existing yes. structure? Just to just to kind of, mm -hmm. this is all very nice. This has possibility, but it might be too dark for the rest of the evening. Right. Let's see what let's see where the the, the new batch of red comes in. But That's I mean, six months from that. or I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Is that well, too that dark? Changes, that changes no. it a lot. It changes. You know, I think I, think I, I do think that is too dark. What you've had, I think that's too dark now. Yeah. <laughs> uh -oh. uh -oh. Someone's yeah. gone over the charcoal. Yeah. You got Mr. It's Clark out of his seat.
You know, I think it, in the central Main Street district, it has that modern alternative. Because we have that center section that's not in the district, district, and you can put something in there more amended instead of section. Yeah. 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 West End, I think, you got to be a little yeah. bit more it's unique. Uh, consistent it, with the historic yeah. district. And it's, I, 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 I agree that this is a little light, like this. Like if you said, more uh, tint or more ochre or more mm -hmm. upper, right? you know, a little not yellow, but burnt, right? I don't know what it means, but um, if it was deeper in some way, mm -hmm. by a hair, not that, that much. Deeper. The one. Well, you know, you'll see yellower, or not like yellower, but browner, 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 right? But with the same sort of variation mm -hmm. of uh, in, inside the color, you know, uh, in the face of. Let me ask you something. We have some time. Are those color right? options? So, I just want to. This is all great. I want to kind of be mindful of the time. No, 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 no. Don't apologize. Don't apologize. We asked you for this. I just we're. I don't want to. I don't want to get to the point where we're. Yeah. Spending more time on this than is necessary now because we do have the time. So this is great. Um, we know where architectural review lands. For the most part, we're down to the brick color. Right. So I think that's what we want to leave yeah. the conversation. Where we want to leave the conversation at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, just so that we can um, give the benefit of time back to the other um, applicants the and next, the rest of us. The new, so the next steps for is on the So the next the next thing we can do for you is uh, talk amongst ourselves and eventually um, possibly act on scheduling a public hearing for you. Right. I guess, uh, is it possible to get a certificate of, uh, of appropriateness for this? Well, that, that'll carry with your overall approval, right? That's why I say we still have some time. Okay. Yeah, we don't do that until the site plan and everything is approved. Exactly. We do it as a package. So, so but su suffice it to say, you, you have really good confidence in all of the elements of the architecture as reviewed by the board, and it's further discussed tonight, um, the only thing is the brick color at this point. And, and the bird proofing, because uh, I proofing. have a running battle with a robin who always puts a nest in my transom window above my front door, and I have to put something at least 45 degrees in order to get that bird not to put a nest there. So having a slight angle won't do it, I don't think. Right, I mean, we can, we, we can, Oh, yeah, we're going to include some snow guards, snow and ice guards on top of the bays also. And then the bird wire just behind it. Hopefully you won't see it from the street. All right. Well, I'll just come up with something that's going to work because otherwise... Proven. You're going to have nesting all along that top edge. Yeah. And then you know what happens then. It's not efflorescence. It's, right. it's uh, bird crap. One. So the top one. one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. So... Uh, just to summarize, I think we're okay with the materials except for the color of the brick. Yep. Um, addressing the concern about birds. John, was there anything else for the minutes, or what's that? Was there anything else from the ARB minutes that we missed, or is that everything? Uh, I think those were the main issues. Top edge of the parapet was an issue for birds, also. Potentially, but but we didn't want to do anything to take away the right. from the design, which everybody liked. Yeah, we'll see what the public says when we uh, have the public here. Yeah, so that's a great segue. <laughs> I'll uh, accept a motion to uh, schedule public hearing. Motion for next month. Motion second. by Len, second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you for hanging in there and uh, okay. have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. It's what we do. You actually came to life with the samples. Yeah, that should be that should be a requirement, I think, in the future that we have physical samples now that the <laughs> pandemic's over. Okay. Next uh, application on the agenda is our continued review of an application for site plan approval, artist studios, five Henry Street. Evening. Hi. 
Welcome back. So, Eric, just real quick, um, were you able to um, determine as far as the Secra, uh, yeah. I, I did not, I thought maybe we had determined it was going to be in the listed, but uh. um, given, the, given the size of the expansion. Uh, expansion, this is the size no. of, I'm sorry, um, this is an existing building. Yeah. Existing building. Right. Mm -hmm. They're not adding any. No. Change to. Let me just take a look. But, I mean, I think we could say it's a type two for now. If it changes, okay. uh, we, you know, we, could, uh, we can incorporate a resolution on secret in the, in the final resolution as well. Uh, I'm comfortable with saying it's a type two. The, the yeah, AV guy who's out in the hall will have to help you. We're all yeah, we're, I'm <laughs> Luddites Not here. that generation. <laughs> if you give me yeah, a computer, like it will stop working within five minutes. <clears throat> um, we also determined that as far as um, Dave's review, the parking no variance is required. That's, I think, uh, no parking is required. In this case, they met the 1964 exception that's in the code, and so no parking is required on this site. Yep. Um, okay. And then just for the board here, the only other thing we're able to talk about that we could potentially act on is scheduling public hearing for next month. <coughs> Mr. Chair, why don't we do it this way? If we determine that um, it is an unlisted action, we'll prepare a, a resolution, you know, direct us to prepare a resolution. We'll, we'll confirm, uh -huh. I'll confirm with Jennifer whether or not we believe it's a type 2 or a unlisted. If it's, if it's determined that it is an unlisted, you can direct us to prepare a resolution for the next meeting. How about we proceed that way? Fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That way we have all the bases covered. So. Yeah, they've already submitted the short EAF. Right, I think it's okay. a, I'm pretty sure it's a type two. I just want to confirm with Jennifer. Okay. She doesn't okay. Um, no, no, I have the cable. It's just a matter of it's whether plug and play or password or. Let me just ask you, in the interest of time, yep. we've, we've got all of your material here. Yeah, we could just speak about it too. Yeah. yeah. As long as you're okay with that, as long as you don't have a yeah, whiz bang presentation you want to share with us. But um, yeah, let's just let's just run through it. So basically, we have a parcel that's a little over a quarter of an acre. It's currently an auto body shop, I believe. And it's, oh, sorry. And it's proposed to be used as an artist studio. Um, I believe on the new the site plan we submitted last month, we made some changes to the exterior of the building. We have some. Um, trees, street trees proposed on Chestnut and Henry Street. And then we have planters um, above ground proposed on the front of the building facing Henry Street. Um, we also did a preliminary inflow and infiltration study. Um, all the exterior drains drain right out, nothing ties in. There are the two interior. Go ahead, here, we'll switch. There are the two interior drains that we will have to do dye tests for, uh, suggested by Mr. Russo, as well as the exterior catch basin steel drain area. Um, so we will be getting those done for you guys. And then I think to the site plan overall, those were the main changes made. Um, there's just some cleanup items and some identification things we have to do for like the stormwater con uh, sewer connections that we need to find. Um, but yeah, I want to thank you. Okay. All right. Great. Um, John Clark. Um, just as far as 
your latest review? Um, uh, yeah, they, they have, um, they, for the lighting plan, they, they proposed up lighting with spot floods, and we don't allow those in, in the city. We don't, okay. Uh, by code, so you're gonna have to use full cutoff down, downward facing fixtures that meet the uh, CRI and color temperatures in the code. Okay. So looking 14, 223, 14B. Um, and they give you the guidance as to what's necessary. Um, thanks for putting in trees, but the trees, um, we, we should have tree well information to make sure that the sidewalks are wide enough that you still have five foot clearance around the tree well. And two of the trees, one's located on a hydrant and one's too close to a utility pole. So they're gonna have to be sort of switched around a little bit so that you have adequate clearance between the building. There's also a utility pole right on the corner of Henry and Chestnut, and you're proposing an extended planter at that corner, which makes it almost, there's no sidewalk left. So uh, that planter is gonna have to be uh, adjusted so that it, you maintain that sort of five foot clearance between the utility pole and the corner of the building. Um, between the utility pole and the planter needs to be five feet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So the you, planter right now is on the property line, so that's why. I was yeah. Well, the, what I'm suggesting right now there's a sidewalk uh, clearance between the utility pole and the building that's about five feet. And you're putting a planter that sh shoots out two or two and a half feet there, and it makes it, you know, blocks the sidewalk at that key corner. So that planter is going to have to be moved east or west or south or something so that it's not obstructing the sidewalk at the corner between the utility pole and the building. Um, Those so are the main points. Uh, the, um, you may want to refer to the architectural review subcommittee. It's, there's some interesting design elements yeah. to the building uh, or not, you, you don't have to. Um, mm. And then I also talked to the building inspector about the sign because it doesn't meet the sign code in a couple of ways. Uh, but since it's not in a historic district, the sign is through the building department, not through the planning board. Yeah. So, we. At least in the architecture plans, we brought it. It meets all the requirements. In it doesn't. It, wow. Okay. Because At least as far as I'm review. I read can, every line of it and made sure every dimension and everything was uh, exactly. I still fit. think it doesn't meet E and G in that section, but it's okay. the, it's uh, Dave Buckley's call. Okay. So just take the sign to him uh, yeah. when the time when, when the site plan is approved, and then you can he, he'll determine whether it meets the code or not. All right. That's right. uh, administrative approval. So that's yeah. under this separate yeah. permit, though, right? Yeah. Okay. Unless it's in the historic district, signs don't come to the planning board. Okay. So those are my main comments. Great. Thanks, John. Um, <clears throat> what are your board's thoughts on ARB subcommittee review on this? Um, moving into the ARB. It, it's the two, two different uh, questions. Um, whether we send it to the ARB, and then if, whether, when. So the, the, the first question I'm posing is? Yes, I think we should send yes. it. Yes, OK. So all agreed? Yes. yes. Hi. OK. So then the next question is when. Um, I don't necessarily know how to answer that. I mean, applicants submitted enough information, at least for John to react, to say, this should go to subcommittee. Um, I just threw it out as an option, but yeah, yeah but they're doing some interesting. When John says something, we could. That are <laughs> but so I, I would I would assume it's enough right now for you all to yeah, sooner review and opine. So let's yeah, I'd get say it scheduled. do it as soon as possible. Okay, so um, motion to do we have to do that? Do motion to yeah. refer this to the ARB. Yep. So motion. I'll accept the motion by Karen. Second. Seconded. Second by Len. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then we'll just work with uh, Dave in the city on scheduling it. Um, then we can talk about um, scheduling public hearing um, for next month. Um, thoughts? 
comments on the schedule or about scheduling, the project? Scheduling public hearing. Oh. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'll accept the motion to schedule public hearing for next month. Motion. Motion by Karen. Seconded. Second by Lynn. All in favor? Aye. 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 And we could also do, we'd also recommend doing a motion. If, if it's determined that it's an unlisted action, we would recommend uh, that you direct us to prepare the resolution on that. It may be a type two, I think. We, okay. My thinking is it's going to be a type two, but in case it's determined to be an unlisted, just direct us to prepare that resolution for next month. Okay. In the event that this is determined to be... Uh, type two, uh, unlisted. unlisted. Yeah. Then uh, motion to again contingent upon it being such. Motion to authorize uh, Eric's office to um, draft um, neck deck. Motion. Motion by Karen. Seconded. Second by Lynn. All in favor? Aye. 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 I think that kind of covers it for now. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you for staying so late. It's a, it's a, lot, it's a lot to do. <laughs> they won't let us leave. Oh. <laughs> okay. So then that takes us to the next item on our agenda, which is 12 Highland Place. And again, this is <clears throat> our, our continued review of an application for a subdivision approval, approval at 12 Highland Place. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Mike Bodendorf, Hudson Land Design, for the applicant. Um, while this is loading up, I'll just give a brief overview of, it's probably best to have the plan up here to, to go through it well. Um, but at the last meeting, um, we were asked to take a look at the private road versus shared driveways and single driveways. Um, we did do that. Um, so the current plan provides access via a private road, centralized throughout the, uh, the overall parcel. Um, all lots now gain access from that private road, so there'll be only one curb cut uh, within Highland Place. Um, the lots in general, the lot sizes didn't change. Uh, the, the house locations really didn't change. Um, we will be changing the position of lot three house to accommodate that existing 36 inch oak. The, the light bulb finally went off in my head, John. I, I see how I can fix that now. I, I didn't realize that I could accommodate that before, so I apologize for that. It looks like a magnificent tree. Yes, it is. It's very nice. Um, so five lot subdivision, one existing lot, three, uh, four new lots, um, all accessing off a proposed private road. Uh, so, yeah, um, great work, I think, combining, consolidating, making sure, you know, we got a single curb cut and that we have what looks to be a cohesive and feasible driveway situation back there. Mm -hmm. um, so, with that, just to kind of highlight some of our, um, just, just more for the board, because I'm sure you've read them, uh, John's comments. Yeah, that yep. they're saving more of the trees. Uh, there's a couple that are located in the middle of a driveway, so they're going to probably have to come out unless the driveway is changed. Um, the one thing that I didn't put in my letter, but I thought about, and I wanted to ask John if it was possible, but if you could switch the water line locations a little bit, one way or another, in in that um, in that easement, could you put a couple trees along the private drive, so you have a tree line yeah. drive coming in? Yeah. Be a nice feature. I think that would help. Absolutely. <clears throat> okay, great. Uh, what are your thoughts, Mr. Russo? Okay, so I'm glad that they went with the private drive. That's an improvement. It's also a reduction in the amount of impervious that they had. And as John said, it allows them to keep a lot of trees. Um, they are in the process of developing an implementation study for the existing structure on the site. Still waiting for test bits with regards to rock, so we can understand what's going on on the site. Are they going to have basements? Are they going to have to look at slabs on grade? What are we dealing with up there? They will need to develop or have their attorney develop maintenance declarations or agreements that will need to be reviewed by the planning board attorney um, and then eventually filed when they file the subdivision plan. Uh, they will also need to develop uh, 
construction cost estimates because they'll need to put up a performance guarantee for the private road. Um, and then we had some other cleanup items with regards to the yard basins, footing drains. Uh, the only other question I had, Mike, was have you looked at putting any drainage out on Highland itself towards the end of this private road? Just to alleviate what's coming down it now. Just to alleviate what's kind of coming down. I mean, I know I saw you taking some of it into the yards and off, but. Would you, are you talking drainage in the right of way or drainage on our site? Drainage in the right of way. Well, actually, drainage off your road before it gets to the right of way. Okay. I don't, I don't expect you to pick up all the road. Right. Um, but I know when the public spoke the last time around, they had concerns with drainage coming out of this project site. So if there's a way we can add a few more structures and tie it in or regrade in a way that it can go to the, some of the yard basins you're going to be proposing. Okay. Yeah, we'll certainly look into that and come up with a plan. Great. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, <clears throat> did we, I'm sorry, did we already circulate intent to act as lead? I believe we did. Yeah, we did, did? You did circulate the 30 days has not passed yet. Okay, so. okay, that's right. Okay, thanks. But we can we can talk about scheduling secret public hearing. Yeah, you can so. schedule a secret public hearing, and you could also direct us to prepare a resolution now if you would like. If you would think it's appropriate. Yeah, well, let's, we can keep it efficient. Then why don't we do or talk at least talk about doing both? Um, so, first item: thoughts on scheduling secret public hearing or a motion. Motion. Motion by Karen. Second. Second by Lynn. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And any thoughts at the same time in yeah. directing Eric's office to draft um, next day? Uh, do we um, do we need to consider any, any of the potential? Um, and this is probably too small, but the, I have a traffic impact question. And if I remember correctly, there were some comments from residents in the neighborhood about speed of traffic being relatively rapid on Grove. You're coming up, zooming along that Gabian wall, and you've got a little bit of a, because of the way the road dips, if you're, if you're coming out of Highland, turning onto Grove, you have some, some limited sight distance because of that hill that goes down towards the west. And I think we had some comments from the public saying, if yeah, we're- we, we actually took a lot of that knot out of there previously. That's all solid rock. No, and that's not what I'm saying, but I was going to ask the question, is there, is, is there a situation where we could ask the applicant to look at traffic calming measures on Grove if we're going to be bringing in five new houses on Highland? We're, we're going to have more people coming out of Highland out of Grove, and you have a condition perhaps where, where there's been a, some habitual you know, quick driving up that hill. But that's know. not a significant amount of traffic being added for four homes, honestly. And some of the other concerns that they've addressed was there was a number of concerns of access points, which we've now yeah. gotten consolidated right. to yep. a single, which is definitely much single location. Right. And one of the access points, or two of them, actually shifted further away from the intersection itself. Um, but for four additional homes, um, okay. I'm, and I'm just kind of throwing this out here because I feel like is there a posted speed limit over there? I don't know. We've I had a lot of. Um, I was going to say part of it would be law enforcement. Yeah, yeah, right. of well, course. We've, we've, I just know that we've on a number of matters here in the city. But we've had a continuing <laughs> thread topic. through my years on the board of projects that never generate any impact. You know, Beacon can apparently absorb all the traffic you can throw at it, whether it's you know 300 unit developments or whatever. And I, I sense I've gotten I got ambushed a couple times in the grocery store by people who are just like incredulous already, and and, and, and you know. Just tell him you're not on the city council. <laughs> Fuck off. Um, I spent an hour in ShopRite talking about, um, you know, uh, the one over by, by um, um, you know, on, off of 52. You know, the, the great debate over whether it's better to enter from, from uh, yeah. the senior housing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, or, be confused. Uh, yeah, and, and I... I commiserate with, I empathize with folks who are like, you know. Yeah, look, I think in this instance, you know. You got to, we have a huge wide yep. boulevard by the church, but then you got to go through senior housing. Yeah. Where you have an existing narrow street 
It's not narrow sidewalks. sidewalks. Well, I know, I, and that's like it's that's 30 feet wide. I went but, out but and I measured. But I think we're going off time. Yeah, we are. Yeah. So it's less get, wide well, than Delavan, but it's still too. plenty wide. Right. Well, I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm, and so I'm just getting sensitive to we're off topic issues. And, so yeah. Yeah. fair enough. As it relates to this, you know, there, there is a posted speed limit. We all know that for some reason, you know, people in Beacon drive like idiots. There's, there's nothing the planning board can do about that, and they drive too fast. It's a policing issue, in, in, in my view. So as long as we've got sight lines covered, we've done everything as part of this planning review to, as we've done, limit this down to one curb cut, move it as far away from the intersection as we can. I think we've done what um, we've been required to do. We just took a hard look. We just confirmed it. We did. So. Great. Thank you. Did the, I just have one question on the yeah. site plan. Do the driveways for lot one and two have to be the full width? Like That's they're what I was so. Just ask. Can they uh, be reduced down? I mean, they're like. They're it, there's no the yard. No, I know. no. There's really no reason. I, it was just for maneuverability, uh, convenience. But, but also, we is can that certainly. The front of the house or the back of the house? The like front. how is the front? That is the. That considered the back. Front. Oh, yeah. it is. Okay. Um, we can we can look at narrowing those down. I just want to make sure the car can turn around in the driveway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just you know I just provided as much Do width they need as possible to turn there. Turn around in the driveway no, for a private. Yeah. Private yeah. Okay. I, you know I didn't know if it was a two car garage, but then even with that, I thought they were a little excessively. Yeah. Wide and you could minimize. The good. But you know, if those are the backs. <clears throat> are there going to be doors on the front around the side there? How are they getting? Right. I believe that there'll be doors probably on that side as well, just to be able to get into the house, especially if there isn't a garage. We haven't gotten that far in detail as far as the, the house design yet. Yeah. Okay. And I'm thinking you may want to show some walkways, so you may have to adjust your grading or whatever else, or, but talk with Gary, see what he's doing. Um, yep. And then also, if we're making the effort to save trees along Highland Place on lot five, Correct. Yes. Um, we need to indicate tree protection fencing because the grading looks like, and the, what's that, footing drain, footing drain looks drain. like you're in, incurring on the trees that you're trying to save. Yep. I'll, uh, you know, I think I missed some trees that, that we're saving. I might have said we're eliminating trees that we might be saving too. So I'll take a hard look at all of that and, and come up with a, okay. a plan that, you know, a tree protection plan aside from everything else. Yeah. And yeah. generally the tree protection fencing plans never, you know, they like right around the, the trunk. It's like a waste of time. It doesn't do anything. Yeah. yeah so. <laughs> okay. Um, what do we got, Kevin? Accessing this many units, would it need to accommodate uh, uh, firefighting equipment? Would that it does. It does. That does. And does it need to be 20 feet wide, or no, it does not need to be a fire access road, right? right? Yes, yeah, it's, it's less than 150 feet long. It's less than 150 feet, but the other thing is there is ample room at the end for a vehicle to turn around, such as a yeah. Okay. This becomes a named street, then, right? I was just looking at another town's. They right. vary. It, it, they actually have to follow appendix D of the fire code. Yeah, it's the state fire code. code. Yeah. Right. That's, right. What was, that's what I, I was looking at. Yeah, and I, I know that I, I didn't read the entire thing. I just looked at the diagrams and wasn't sure if uh, it was a... You know how many times we have to deal with it on a daily basis? <laughs> well, this is your job. I don't know what the heck he's doing. No, I anyway. Know. Uh, um, you'll have to forgive me. It's really late. Did we schedule the secret public hearing? You did. Oh, thank God. We did. Okay. <laughs> you were kind of at the point of whether Eric should prepare a resolution. Yes. Thank you for bringing us back. So, I'll accept a motion to direct Eric's office to authorize to draft neg deck. Motion for Eric's office to draft the neg deck. Motion on the table. Second. Second. Second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anything else we can do? I think that's it. Awesome. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Some cleanup and focus on pavement and landscape. Very good. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda 
is <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, 281 Rombat Avenue. Uh, this is a review of an application. This is new on the agenda for special use permit and site plan approval. Plus lingering feelings of abandonment. Evening. of boards that somehow are able to curtail their agendas. I don't know why we can't do it. <laughs> do they fund I, mean, do I don't know. Do they fund? Do they make them wait? One of the towns that I used to present in, the town of Fallsburg up in Sullivan County, they used to have this problem that go on. So basically they put into effect um, more or less a rule that if you weren't up by 11 o'clock, you got pushed to the next agenda. Yeah. If you got up at 10.59, that's they would, they you would spend the whole time yeah. there or whatever else. But anybody after that? Most other planning boards meet twice a month. Oh, God. Yeah, that's, <laughs> good, that's the other difference. Yeah, my okay. Twice a month. Kind of goes All right. Just limit who's getting on. Just, yeah, I like that. Take a hard line. <laughs> so I'm excited to be the first Good one evening. to present on April 10th, August 10th. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's an exciting <laughs> moment right here. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, uh, J.C. Calderon, Calderon Architecture and Design, uh, uh, presenting for uh, a client, Marie, Mar um, Marianne Corsa, 281 Roundbot Avenue. Um, so the, the application is for um, to convert an existing permitted uh, utility shed from 2019 which doesn't show up on Google Maps, but it, it exists. And uh, it doesn't even show up on the location map on parcel axis. But um, that's the survey, uh, which it does show up on. The, uh, so basically, um, the, the, you see there in the location doesn't show up either there, parcel axis. We, we have updated uh, the notes as requested. Um, that, that were incorrect, and, um, and we'll, we'll update, you know, we'll send that in. The shed is going to be converted to an accessory dwelling unit, um, two level, uh, about 353 square feet. Um, again, we're not changing the footprint, all the change will be inside the shed. The, um, the existing shed has a concrete slab. These drawings are updated from what, you know, I had slightly updated from what, what we had submitted, which was not complete, but basically uh, reflects the concrete slab and uh, again, the change in the inside. Um, the upstairs is, sh is now shaded to reflect where the areas are being taken from because it's a gambled roof. We're not counting the sides below five feet. Um, so basically we're addressing all the comments from John Russo and John Clark in the next submission. And I guess we'd like to request uh, consideration for a public hearing. I know, it's, I know it's not on Google Maps, but I walk pass there frequently with my dog and I can vouch that that structure exists where they say it does. <laughs> yeah, I went up to pictures because I couldn't see it on Google Maps either. <laughs> yeah, I know it's there. And and it, we walked past it maybe. It was, um, <laughs> it's right where those cars are 
it's right on one street. It's yeah. one color, yeah. one street. It's, it's, yeah, I was like, wait. It's, 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 it's permit number 219-0245. Need to look it up with the building department. Right here. Um, so we are, what, one, one thing that's different or unexpected was that we are going to connect to the sewer line on Rombout and not connect to the existing building. The water line will connect to the existing house, but the, again, the sewer line will connect and we'll modify all the um, designations as, as requested in uh, John Russo's letter. Um, One question about the parking, uh, John Clark, was that um, you know we, we showed uh, Rombout as the front of the building, as the fr uh, front yard with the 15-yard setback, and Teller as the side. Um, there's approximately 40 feet from the garage to the lot line, John, that we could show. The two uh, 9 by 18 spaces would be 36 feet. So you'd, we'd have like, if, if we were to make um, Rombout the, the side yard and Teller the front yard, um, we'd, we would have a one foot overlap. So I'm wondering if that, because the client doesn't necessarily want to do the third three cars in a row. Yeah, that's, um, that's the option, is to go three cars in a row so that you're not in the, in the required mm -hmm. setback. Right. Uh, you have the option, I guess, of, of declaring Teller your front yard. The house will be non-conforming, right. um, but you still may have to to have a five-yard setback, uh, a five-foot setback on the side yard. Right. And you can't quite make that. Right. We have about four and change. The, the, Brendan Johnson didn't give us the dimension yet, exactly how far it is, but it, it measures to about 40 feet, not yeah. 41. So that's the problem. So I think the simpler thing would be to do is to, is to put three in a row. Right. As long as it's five feet from the rear lot line. Right. That's probably what we're going to do. Um, it's just going to demolish their garden, which they have right here. It's quite yeah. Nice. I mean, I wouldn't have a. You know, 27 foot driveway going out there, you have a narrower driveway that swells up to three spaces right. near the building. Right. And that way you can maybe get around that corner of that little fence garden area. Okay. And, um, and we'll show exterior lighting as well. There is existing exterior lighting that we didn't show yet, but we'll, we'll show that. Um. Well, this is just a delineation of the garden. It's not a fixed, fixed wall or anything. John, if the, exterior, if the existing exterior lighting is there and sufficient, um, but if that doesn't comply with the section, what, what, how does that work? Yeah, well, there's an exemption for lumens under 600, I think it is, or something like that, which is a normal porch light. So mm -hmm. unless it has a, you know, 100 watt, uh, flood light, you're, you're probably fine. Okay. Just say that the, uh, the bulb will be under 60, 60 watt or whatever. Normal porch lights are exempt from that Six requirement. Yeah, okay. I don't know what that is, uh, threshold is. It's only if you want to put a new light on that we really worry about it too much. Right. No, they, have a, they have an existing light in the front of the garage. Okay. It might be enough. Okay. okay. Just show out the plans and say existing light. Okay. Thanks, John. Mr. Russo. Mr. Calderon said uh, we have comments with regards to the notes. Uh, two of the sheets, he's correcting those. Um, we've asked for additional information on the sewer and the water, um, how it's being installed, where it's being connected to, all the construction details related to that. Um, also, separation distances as required by the Department of Health for separation distances between the two utilities um, and some other cleanup information. Great. Thanks. Um, I think at this point we can talk about um, placing this on the um, calendar for next month uh, for public hearing. Uh, any thoughts? Motion? 
Motion by Lynn. Second. Second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. What else can we do for you? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Okay. We'll see you next month. <laughs> All right. Maybe All right. earlier. Thank you. All right. Um, well, unless anybody has any other business, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. We don't have any zoning board with this. All right. Motion to adjourn. Whoa. <laughs> uh, motion. Second. <laughs> I, I motion by Len, second by Kevin. Kevin, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.